House come to order. Prayer by the chaplain. Let us pray. God of all creation, we give you thanks for your servants of every time and place, especially today, for this house. For the good, gifted, smart, and compassionate people, your dedicated servants here. We thank you that they take both joy and seriousness the tasks that have been set before them in public office. Keep us all mindful of our high calling here, to converse with respect, dignity, and civility. May our hearts and our minds be open to the welfare of all people. If there are any of your servants here that are hurting, bring healing and also bring courage that all here may speak what is good, right, and salutary for the good of all. Amen. The chaplain today is Bishop, uh, Bishop Thomas M. Aiken, Northeastern Minnesota Synod of Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, Duluth, Minnesota. Pledge of Allegiance. Please remain standing and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. The clerk will take the roll. The clerk will close the roll. A quorum is present. The clerk will read the journal of the preceding day. Journal of the House, 88th session, 2013. 33rd day, St. Paul, Minnesota, Wednesday, April 10th, 2013. Uh, if there's no objection, further reading of the journal will be dispensed with and the journal will be approved as corrected by the chief clerk. Hearing no objection, the journal is approved as corrected by the chief clerk. Comparison reports. There's a copy of this order of business on each member's desk. If there's no objection, those motions will prevail. Hearing no objections, those motions prevail. Reports of standing committees and divisions. Copy this order of business has been placed on each member's desk. If there's no objection, those reports will be adopted. Hearing no objection, those reports are adopted. Second reading of House Files. Second reading, House File 588. Second reading. Second reading, House File 1041. Second reading. Second reading, House File 1389. Second reading. Second reading of Senate Files. Second reading, Senate File 953. Second reading. Introduction of bills. The following House files have been offered for introduction today. The Chief Clerk will report the House files and give them their first reading. Introduction and first reading of House File 1757 through 1769. First reading, House File 1757 through 1769. Messages from the Senate. Message from the Senate. Mr. Speaker, I hereby announce the passage by the Senate of the following Senate file herewith transmitted. Senate File 76, uh, Act Relating to Transportation. Signed, Joanne Zoff, uh, Secretary of the Senate. First reading of Senate Files. Introduction and first reading of Senate File 76, an Act Relating to Transportation. Pursuant to Article 4, Section 19 of the Constitution of the State of Minnesota, Howell moves 
that the rule therein be suspended and urgency be declared, and that the rules of the House be so far suspended so that Senate File 76 be given its second and third readings and be placed upon its passage. Representative Howe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And members, uh, the reason the rules have to be uh, suspended is because the Senate took this file up in the, this, this morning, and we've got to, in order to take this file up and pass this this afternoon, in order to hear it on the same day, we've got to suspend the rules in order to hear it on the same day. So I would uh, appreciate your support of suspension of the rules so we can move forward and hear this bill this afternoon. Any further discussion? Representative Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. And I just want to say I support the motion to suspend the rules and declare an urgency. Representative Doubt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. I also speak in favor of the motion. Seeing no further discussion, all in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. Motion prevails. The clerk will give the bill its second and third reading. Second reading. Second reading, Senate File 76. Second reading. There's no uh, amendments at the desk, so the clerk can give the bill its third reading. Well, uh, third reading, Senate File 76. Third reading. Representative Howe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Excuse me. Members, as we take up Senate File 76, which... Uh, I would like to acknowledge the guests we have on the House floor, Officer Tom Decker's brother, Eddie Decker, uh, City of Cold Spring Mayor Doug Schmidt, City of Cold Spring Police Chief Phil Jones, and City of Cold Spring City Administrator Paul Hetland. Welcome. Members, this bill renames 11 miles of Highway 23 from the ed eastern edge of Col City of Cold Spring to the western edge of the City of Richmond. And it renames it the Officer Tom Decker Memorial Highway. This stretch of highway would be the stretch of highway that Officer Decker was assigned to patrol, so it's only fitting that we rename it in his honor. Officer Decker, if you it just remind you, Officer Decker was shot and killed the night of November 29th, 2012, as he responded to a call for a welfare check on a suicidal person. He gave his life trying to help others. Renaming this highway is not only an honor in Officer Decker's sacrifice to the citizens, but it's also a tribute to his committed, commitment to helping others. Naming this officer after Officer Tom Decker will be remembered of what is, what's important in life, and that is people and relationships. We must have a reminder of the consequences of forgetting just that. When we forget that people and relationships are what is important, the resulting events can change the course of our lives. Having been a commander of troops in combat, that has had soldiers killed and wounded. I understand the effects of these types of tragedies. Those events change our lives forever. And just as this event has changed the lives of Officer Decker's family, the Cold Spring Police Department, the city and employees, and the, commitment, and the community of Cold Spring as a whole, life-changing events as these must be remembered so that we don't allow them to be repeated. This, will be this bill will ensure that we identify that stretch of highway as a f for Officer Decker and remember and honor the f sacrifice of Officer Tom Decker. I ask you to support this bill. Representative Schoen. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker and Representative Howell. Thank you uh, for carrying this legislation. I'd like to thank the uh, Decker family and the community of Cold Spring for allowing us to be a part of their lives this uh, last year. It's been a difficult road for them and from the law, enforce law enforcement community as a whole. This is extremely important. Every day I get to walk out of this Capitol and look across the courtyard and see the Peace Officer Memorial here in St. Paul. And I am very honored to see the memorial go back to his home community. So thank you, Arge Green vote. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the bill. Clerk will close the roll. There being 130 ayes and zero nays, the bill is passed and its title agreed to. Calendar for the day. The first bill on the calendar for the day is House File 748. The clerk will report the bill. House File 748, number one on the calendar for today, an act, uh, second engrossment, an act relating to employment. Uh, the author of the bill, Representative Simon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Uh, members, this bill, House File 748, fixes the law that gives Minnesota workers the right to make claims for unpaid wages. And the, the bill comes out of a Supreme Court decision in Minnesota last September, the Caldas case. And that case is really an example how sometimes the courts can give us and the legislature a blueprint about how to fix our laws and make them better. Because in that case, um, the court said that our unpaid wages statute, which we've had on the books for nearly 100 years, was unclear. And for about a century, business and labor had relied, until last September, on that law for guidance about how to handle these kinds of claims, where there was some sort of dispute about unpaid wages. But the court in that Caldas case said that the century-old assumptions were incorrect. And the reason they said it was incorrect primarily, among other reasons, was they said that our law did not define the term unpaid wages. And so this bill does that. So the language in here is heavily negotiated. I've worked with folks from the Chamber of Commerce, from other groups, um, listened to them even before the bill was introduced. And I've gone back and forth with many of these groups, and I think we have agreed upon language that restores the understanding that existed before the Supreme Court decision last September. You can read for yourself the new definition. I won't do it for you here on line 1.0. It's repeated, uh, 1.10, I should say. It's, it's repeated elsewhere in the bill. Uh, but basically, other than that, the only major change is that uh, a worker who's claiming unpaid wages now has to make that claim in writing, although the worker does not have to specify the amount of the allegedly uh, unpaid wages because, after all, sometimes the worker doesn't know, and sometimes that information resides with the employer. That really is it, members. Um, there was no audible dissent or opposition in any committee. I, had no, no of, I don't know of any particular group that opposes this. This just restores the common understanding that both business and labor relied upon before the September decision by the Supreme Court. And again, a reminder, this is an example where Supreme Court decisions can really be a, mo a roadmap or a blueprint for us to improve uh, our laws in Minnesota, and this is an example of that. I ask for your support. Thanks. Representative Garofalo. I would the author of the bill yield for a question. He will yield. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Simon, during the process, you addressed some of the concerns the Chamber of Commerce had brought forward. Can you please outline for the members of the body some of those, uh, some of those changes you made to the bill in the process? Representative Simon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Garofalo, um, there were two that I can think of, the two really big ones. One happened before the bill was intro even introduced when we were trading some language. Uh, the Chamber originally had a concern that the bill draft could have been interpreted by a court as allowing for double counting. Um, and so we made a change that was satisfactory to the chamber in terms of alleviating that concern. So nobody thinks that this bill allows for double counting. That was never the intention. It was just, could someone make that argument? And then the second issue, as I recall, was after we had introduced it, there was a question about what happens if you have an employee who, though he or she may be uh, due some unpaid wages, actually did something wrong. Maybe they stole or embezzled. Could the employer then deduct those wages from what was owed? Obviously, everyone in this chamber would say yes. 
Uh, the Chamber of Commerce was concerned that the bill as worded implied that that couldn't happen. Of course, that wasn't the intention. So once again, there, this time by an amendment, because the bill had already been introduced, we satisfied that concern. So my understanding is those two concerns, there may have been one other, I just can't remember right now, but all other concerns have been addressed. Representative Garofalo. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the author for working with all the stakeholders on this bill and uh, getting a, a – I don't want to say peace in the valley because that's a Greg David's patented line. I, he has a copyrighted. But I do want to thank Representative Simon for working with all the parties involved. And I would encourage members on both sides of the aisle to support the Simon bill. Thank you. The clerk will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, House File 748. Third reading, Representative McNamara. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and members, and Representative Simon, thank you for bringing this bill forward. It's a good common sense bill. Appreciate you working with uh, labor and industry to get this done, and would look forward to everybody voting for the bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and members. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the bill. The clerk will close the roll. There being 131 ayes and zero nays, the bill is passed and its title agreed to. The next bill on the calendar for the day is House File 1243. The clerk will report the bill. House File 1243, number two on the calendar for today, the first engrossment. An act relating to commerce. Uh, the author of the bill, Representative Atkins. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is uh, the Department's Securities Bill. I want to thank members uh, in the Commerce Committee for their unanimous uh, bipartisan support for it. Uh, this is one time where the federal government got it right. Uh, they actually gave states more rights uh, and more oversight authority with respect to securities regulation. Uh, as you know, uh, securities regulation is shared between the state and the federal government. Until uh, Dodd-Frank occurred, uh, that allowed the state of Minnesota had, to have primary authority over investment uh, uh, advisor regulation up to $25 million. This extends the uh, primary authority of the state up to $100 million. Again, it has bipartisan uh, support and committee, and I'd uh, uh, urge a green vote and appreciate your support. be happy to answer any questions. No amendments at the desk. The clerk will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, House File 1243. Third reading, Representative O'Driscoll. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Atkins, I, I miss my days on the Commerce Committee with you and the other folks, and so this just gives me a chance to ask a few questions and kind of bring you back to the old days. Uh, why is it that the federal government is abdicating this authority to the state and not under 65, uh, uh, Series 65 and 66, where FINRA has regulation on Maybe you could just speak to that for a few minutes for me, please. Representative Atkins. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Representative O'Driscoll. And I don't think it'll take uh, a few minutes, but uh, FINRA, as you know, is a private uh, self-regulatory uh, entity, and, that's, and it's, it plays an important role. Uh, but uh, I wouldn't say the feds are abdicating their authority to the states. Uh, they're just sharing their authority further with the states. Uh, as you know, the, uh, the primary authority and, and secondary authority until now has been primary at the state up to the $25 million in assets level. Uh, this will extend that up to $100 million. Representative O'Driscoll. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Atkins, would you yield to another question, please? He will yield. Representative O'Driscoll. Well, Representative Atkins, with, with this, in the Dodd-Frank uh, process, in conformity on this, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I, I well, thank you. With, with conformity under Dodd-Frank, does this have an additional cost to the Department of Commerce for regulatory oversight on this, or are they able to absorb it within their current budget, or is there any fiscal impacts on this? Representative Atkins. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Representative O'Driscoll. Uh, it does have uh, uh, or create more work for our Department of Commerce. Uh, there's about four FTEs that have been built into the Commerce Omnibus Bill. And the Commerce Omnibus Bill has been rolled into the Jobs, Commerce, and Housing Omnibus Bill that will be heard on the House floor on Monday. 
Representative O'Driscoll. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I was wondering if Representative Albright would yield to a question, please. He will yield. Representative O'Driscoll. Representative Albright, if I'm not mistaken, you have experience in the securities industry, and I guess I would ask you to maybe expand a little bit about how this might affect the industry from your perspective as a compliance officer. Representative Albright. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, members, this is a conformity bill, as uh, Representative Atkins uh, has stated. It does uh, promulgate some additional uh, rules that uh, will require some additional costs on the, on the, on the, on the basis of the uh, uh, Commerce Commission. Um, I do have a, a, a couple of questions for the author of the speaker, if he would yield. Uh, he can't, because you're yielding to Representative O'Driscoll. Well, I, Mr. Mr. Speaker, if uh, Representative Albright would be able to provide a little bit of background from my, from my question, and then uh, he would be able to ask at some point when you recognize him to uh, ask those questions of Representative Atkins or Chair Atkins on that. And again, Representative Albright, the question was, as a practitioner, how do you see these laws affecting your industry? Representative Albright. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and Representative O'Driscoll. In the, in the last five years, uh, the Dodd-Frank and other regulations that have been uh, impacted upon our industry have become very onerous in terms of our obligation for compliance. Uh, it has been no small uh, measure of effort on the part of the securities industry to keep up with the uh, mon monotony of the uh, disclosures that we as uh, agents uh, it even uh, goes so far as to uh, require disclosure of family members and their holdings uh, with regard to investments. Uh, we are also in a, in a state where uh, agents who are duly registered under the SEC as well as the FINRA uh, have to uh, abide by two sets of laws and regulatory environments. And so it becomes very confusing. <clears throat> it also can become very cumbersome from a standpoint of actually trying to do business uh, as opposed to uh, uh, assist uh, investors with their security questions. So in this day and age, uh, we are uh, being inundated by additional regulations. Our concern is whether or not this uh, adds to the, uh, the layers that are already uh, uh, upon us. Representative O'Driscoll. Oh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Representative Albright, I think it's only fair to ask you the same question that I asked the chair. And is there a fiscal impact on your industry or in your particular uh, broker dealer or investment advisory uh, organization as to uh, implementation of this law? Representative Albright will yield. Representative Albright. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and Representative Riscoll, yes, there very much is. And in our uh, uh, business alone, we've had to actually add a person and a half just to cover. Uh, the costing uh, that's associated with the uh, compliance measures that have been put into place by Dodd-Frank. Representative Albright. Would the author of the bill yield for a question? He will yield. Representative Albright. Uh, Mr. Speaker and uh, Representative Atkins, I'm just wondering whether or not uh, this bill would uh, add any uh, complexity to duly registered agents in this state? Representative Atkins. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Representative Albright. Um, and just one editorial note, and I would, uh, I think, relative to the back and forth that just occurred, that uh, you'd probably prefer, though, that that regulation, the primary regulation, be at a place in St. Paul rather than a place in Washington, D.C., at least for my little law firm, uh, we much prefer to deal with folks in St. Paul than deal with Washington, D.C. Um, I don't believe it will create any further uh, uh, requirements for those who are already registered. There are some entities that aren't currently primarily uh, or under the primary oversight of the Department of Commerce. I believe it's uh, about 375 um, registered investment advisors that will now fall under the primary authority of the Department of Commerce. Uh, and to the extent that they're not registered or working with the Department of Commerce now, they would need to. But I think it's a lot easier to work with our Department of Commerce than it probably is to work with the folks in D.C. But I'll let you speak to that, Representative Albright. Representative Albright. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And would the author yield for an additional question? He will yield. Representative Albright. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and to the author, um, with regard to... Uh, the uh, audit uh, perspective and review uh, that the commissioner would hold over uh, those agents that have up to uh, that first threshold, would that also add a layer of audit review that the FINRA is already performing on behalf of the broker-dealer community in the state? 
Representative Atkins. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Representative Allwright, keep in mind, uh, and I uh, am always mindful, I have greatest respect in the world for FINRA, uh, but it is a private, self-regulating entity, uh, and one that I think our Department of Commerce has a great deal of respect for as well. Uh, but that doesn't uh, supersede or, uh, or replace uh, the efforts that our own Department of Commerce uh, also has responsibility for. And, I'm sure, and I see you nodding, so I think you agree with that. Uh, we're not looking to increase or, or put uh, huge amounts of additional burden. I think the point here really is, as I said, to have primary authority and oversight rest here in St. Paul, where a securities dealer or, or uh, agent is able to contact somebody in St. Paul rather than Washington, D.C. Representative Albright. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, would the author rise for just a final question? He will. Representative Albright. Now, Representative Atkins, then, in your estimation, then, this is uh, purely nothing more than a conformity to the Dodd-Frank enactment? Representative Atkins. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and thank you, Representative Albright. Um, the the primary purpose here was to comply with uh, with Dad Frank. My understanding is it's primarily conformity. I've specifically posed that question to the department as we've been talking about. If there's, my understanding is that there are not uh, significant additional requirements. There was uh, one of the references back that I just got a no on would be if you're also registered in Iowa and here. But I think we're now getting into the truly into the weeds. And I know that you've been in contact also with the department. I think we should uh, jointly visit with them. But there was no intention to to massively increase the amount of uh, burdensome regulations over investment uh, folks here in Minnesota. Representative Hoppe. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, members, we can differ on how much Dodd-Frank is influencing this, and Representative Atkins is uh, carrying this bill, you know, whether it's 100 percent compliance or not. My argument is not with the bill and not that we're doing it. Members, I think we need to be careful, and I've said this before and I'm going to say it again on the House floor, when we start thinking about the ramifications of the Dodd-Frank Act in the state of Minnesota, we're looking at increased compliance, increased regulatory environment, we're looking at financial institutions, whether they're selling securities or just regular banks, having to go to increased levels of compliance and hiring extra people to be able to just comply with all the new federal regulations. A lot of Dodd-Frank was tended to um, correct problems or perceived problems in the banking industry. A lot of those problems were with big, giant banks from the East Coast. But the ramifications of this bill are going to be felt all throughout Minnesota. So we are going to be looking at, in all probability, far fewer banks in the state of Minnesota. And I've said it before, that doesn't necessarily mean we're going to be looking at less opportunity for people to get financing or credit but they might not be able to get it from their local small town bank because that small town bank might not exist anymore except as a branch of a larger bank that can afford to handle all the compliance work. So whether we're looking at ag loans or small businesses or just everyday ordinary people that like to use banks and credit unions, ladies and gentlemen, we need to pay attention to this. This is going to have a major impact in the state of Minnesota in the years to come. Thank you for your attention. Representative Druskowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. One if the author would yield for a question. He will yield. Representative Druskowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Representative Atkins, uh, I'm trying to uh, understand the bill. I'm not on the committee that, and uh, read the bill for the first time today. Uh, but on line 17 or page 17 of the bill, it refers to a representative of the administrator. Uh, is that the commissioner of commerce or? or their uh, workers, or who, are, who, who is the bill referring to there? Representative Atkins. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Druskowski, if you'll give me a moment to, uh, to confer, I'll find that I wasn't uh, quite ready for a question on page 17 relative to who the administrator is of the, of the representative, but uh, um, I am uh, trying to confer and talk long enough so that the folks from the department who are also listening to this debate can reference uh, which in particular uh, uh, the, um, that representative is a reference to. Uh, if you'd like to make some comments and then I'll answer your question, I'd be happy to. Okay. Representative Juskowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Representative Atkins and members, I guess the part that caught my attention is uh, on that same page further down, uh, the bill offers the uh, authority to somebody, it says, uh, 
such other information as the administrator determines is necessary and appropriate is in the public interest and for the protection of investors and gives them uh, that person or people uh, additional authority and further down it says again um, containing such information as the administrator deems necessary and appropriate in the public interest so what I'm wondering representative Atkins are we granting the Department of Commerce and their workers uh, the latitude through the language in the bill to determine what is uh, necessary and appropriate as they collect this information uh, from these financial uh, institutions and advisors. Representative Atkins. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Representative Driskowski. All I had to do was look on page one of the bill. Administrator is the is the Commissioner of Commerce, and uh, and yes, it does grant that authority to the Commissioner of Commerce to do essentially what they've been doing in Minnesota for uh, for many many years. Uh, with respect to investment uh, agents and, and funds up to twenty five million dollars this extends it now to those with assets up to a hundred million dollars uh, and gives minnesota's uh, regulators primary authority rather than the feds uh, uh, with respect to those entities representative Jaskowski. thank you mr speaker well, representative atkins i i as you and representative hoppy have talked about the bill and our need to bring conformity i understand that i accept that uh, however, the, this language in the bill and the authority that it confers upon the Department of Commerce seems to me to be very broad, lacks specificity, and not in the best interest of our folks if we are providing them that type of authority. I mean, it's basically, to me it says it's up to the Department of Commerce and their staff to determine what information is necessary and appropriate and they can demand it. Um, I, I, I struggle with uh, the bill being written that way. Um, very likely won't support it because of that broad language. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative O'Driscoll. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And with the uh, exchange that's been going on since I last spoke, I do have a few more questions for Representative Atkins if he'd be willing to yield. He will yield. Representative O'Driscoll. Representative Atkins, you indicated that there's going to be four new FTEs that are going to be in the Department of Commerce. Can you uh, kind of enumerate what those uh, positions might be so we get a better idea as to uh, how this new uh, internal enforcement uh, mechanism will uh, transpire in the Department of Commerce? Representative Atkins. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank Rep Representative O'Driscoll. I don't have the specific titles for those positions, but they will do what has already been taking place in the Department of Commerce for those entities up to $25 million. The fact is, is that they're going to have oversight over additional uh, investment uh, uh, folks up to $100 million, and they will have more significant, obviously, when you've got more folks to provide oversight. But I don't know their titles. I just know that they're going to continue doing for entities that have up to $100 million in assets what they've been doing for entities with assets up to $25 million. Representative O'Driscoll. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. If Representative Atkins would yield to another question. He will yield. Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Atkins, um, will the prosecutory authority rest in the Department of Commerce or in another agency or in another division here in the state of Minnesota for those uh, violations? Is there going to be any change from the $25 million threshold to the $100 million threshold? Representative Atkins. I, uh, Mr. Speaker, I, was the question whether they'd have confiscatory authority? Representative O'Driscoll. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, I realize it's a little noisy in here, and it's probably sometimes difficult to hear the, uh, the, uh, the question. It was prosecutory authority. Do they have the ability to prosecute within the Department of Commerce for those who violate? Representative Atkins. And thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Representative O'Driscoll. They have the same authority that they currently have. It's just that they have it up to $100 million in assets, rather than it's currently it's been limited up to $25 million. Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Atkins, if you yield to another question, please. He will yield. Representative O'Driscoll. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Atkins, as far as uh, violating the law, now we're going to be enforcing uh, that threshold to $100 million here in the state of Minnesota. Do you anticipate or, or have you been in conversations with the department about changing uh, any kind of regulatory fines or other kind of um, disciplinary action censures, revocation, suspensions, or general disciplinary actions because of moving from 25 million to 100 million? 
Representative Atkins. Mr. Speaker, Representative, no, I have not. Representative Albright. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I uh, was wondering if the author would uh, uh, yield for a question. He will yield. Representative Albright. Repre Thank you, Mr. Uh, Speaker. Uh, Representative Atkins, uh, there is language in the bill that specifies uh, uh, the baseline uh, information that is uh, requisite to the commissioner for uh, audit, but it also says in the bill that the, uh, it may include establishment of different reporting requirements for different classes of fund advisors. I'm just wondering if you could elaborate on the differentiation of the classes. And I'm specifically thinking about family foundations. I'm thinking about charitable endeavors by some of our uh, founding families in the state who have investment advisory services attributable to those uh, foundations. And I'm wondering if from a... Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'm wondering if the, the, for the sanctity and privacy of their financial records and their investment policies and, and, and the dialogue that they've had at committee meetings, I'm wondering if that, that type of intrusion is considered uh, in this language. Representative Atkins. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Representative Albright. Uh, there is no legislative intent, and there's no, uh, I don't believe the language reads in the fashion that it would change anything that is not already current in law. The only thing that uh, is designed to change here is the authority, the primary authority being given to the Department of Commerce for the amount of assets, up from 25 to up to $100 million. Representative Albright. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Representative Atkins. Would you yield for another question, Mr. Speaker? He will yield. Representative Albright. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Representative Atkins, um, it talks uh, in the language also about um, periodic uh, audits. I'm wondering if, uh, if that's an annual, if it is on a, on a, a nondescript, if it is uh, spontaneous, or are they going to receive a letter two weeks prior to so they can prepare for the audit? Uh, what the what scope and parameters of the audit might be, is that to be laid out here or is that part of the policy for the Commerce Commission? Representative Atkins. Uh, specifically, Mr. Speaker and Representative Albright, there we are seeking no changes with respect to the Department's current audit authority. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the bill. Clerk will close the roll. There being 81 ayes and 49 nays, the bill is passed and its title agreed to. The next bill on the calendar for the day is House File 834. The clerk will report the bill. House File 834, number 3 on the calendar for the day, an act relating to metropolitan planning activities. The author of the bill, Representative Fisher. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this bill has an impact on the Metropolitan Area Water Supply Advisory Committee. It was originally scheduled to sunset on uh, December 31st, 2012. And what this bill does is ask for the extension to be uh, moved until 20, uh, December 31st, 2016. And this advisory committee assisted the Met Council with planning and developing methods for the region and meeting its needs for drinking water. I want to thank uh, Representative Runback for her help on this bill, and I ask for a green vote. There's no amendments at the desk. The clerk will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, House File 834. Third reading, Representative Anderson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Speaker. I was wondering if Representative Fisher would yield to some questions. He will. Representative Anderson. Um, I was hoping, Representative Fisher, you could help me out with this a little bit. As I'm reading this bill, you're making it retroactive. Can you tell me why? 
Representative Fisher. Uh, making it retroactive to catch the, catch the uh, opportunity that to uh, cover the ground that it had been covering already. Uh, we just want to make sure that we don't leave any holes because they are working with people from different state agencies. And so we just want to make sure that we have the comfort levels across the board for everybody that's been involved in the process. Representative Anderson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, Representative Fisher, have they been continuing to operate then during this time uh, that they have not that the board has been expired. Can you tell me that? Representative Fisher will yield. Representative Fisher. Uh, Representative Anderson, uh, they've been uh, very cautiously moving in that area. They're hoping that we can uh, uh, make it official, but they are working behind the scenes, but they feel much more comfortable being able to have official authority to continue this process. Representative Anderson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And if Representative Fisher would continue to yield. He will yield. Representative Anderson. Representative Fisher, can you tell me what expenses have they been Reimbursing then expenses, I, I know that in the original law, they're allowed to reimburse for expenses. Have they been doing that the last couple of months? Representative Fisher. Uh, Representative Anderson, I cannot answer that point. I do know the only uh, expenses that they were able to reimburse for was mileage expenses. Representative Anderson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, Representative Fisher, do you know in their time of existence, how much they spent on travel reimbursement at all? Representative Fisher will yield. Representative Fisher. Thank you, Representative Anderson. No, I'm sorry, I cannot answer that question. Representative Anderson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Representative Fisher, do you know that under this uh, bill that you have, would they now be able to go back and then reimburse those folks for those expenses uh, through this route? Representative Fisher will yield. Representative Fisher. Uh, Representative Anderson, I cannot give a 100% answer on that one. Uh, my guess is that part of the reason they wanted to make it official is so that if there have been some expenses on mileage, they'd be able to go back and make that official with the state agencies. Representative Anderson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Representative Fisher, did you ask for a local impact note at all or a fiscal note for this? Not much on it. Representative Fisher. Representative Anderson, to my knowledge, there, there was no fiscal note attached to this. I do know that the Met Council has not paid. Uh, they're the ones that take care of paying uh, the expenses for this. They have not incurred any expenses and are waiting for the uh, official uh, movement of this bill here so that they can pay the Met uh, expenses out of their budget. Representative Anderson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Fisher, you would need to request the, the fiscal note, the actual local impact note, in order for us to understand if what the cost, if any, is going to be. Obviously, if they're reimbursing expenses, that is going to cost money. And as I understand it, the Met Council gets that from the counties that are in here. Uh, Representative Fisher, can you tell me why you put in the bill you Are you have, asking Representative Fisher to yield? I am asking him to yield, yes, He Mr. will Speaker. yield, Representative Anderson. You're, you have in here the bill. You've actually listed out the counties. Can you tell me why that is? Representative Fisher. Representative Anderson, uh, uh, the counties that uh, were listed out in the area uh, were to uh, list out not only the current counties, but if I remember right, um, as I'm taking a look at the different counties here, Uh, it also added four counties in there that were originally added as the, at the request of the legislature, and that's why we have the extra counties in there, because besides the metropolitan area, there were four additional counties added in. Representative Anderson. Uh, Ms. Representative uh, Fisher, if you would yield enough to another question, please. He will yield. Representative Anderson. Representative Fisher. This was sunset basically last year. Can you tell me why that is? Representative Fisher. Uh, Representative Anderson, it was originally sunsetted because they thought the work would be done at that point in time. Representative Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And so, Representative Fisher, if you would yield to another question. He will yield. Representative Anderson. Representative Fisher, you're saying it's going to take them another four years to do their work. I mean, can you tell me what was your thought process in putting this together as far as determining that four years was the magic number? Representative Fisher. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Anderson, uh, part of the reason that they have the extension going on there is twofold. Is number one is that the uh, there were four counties added in halfway through the process, that partway through the process that they did not expect. Um, and so they need that extra time to get the work done. I do know that as they've been going through the process that they've been running into some unusual situations, particularly in the East Metro where uh, they're finding out that the aquifers are having an extensive impact on surface waters. And so it's been a little bit more complicated than they were originally expecting. Representative Anderson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Representative Fisher, if you would yield. He will yield. Representative Anderson. Representative Fisher, can you tell me why the why four years? I mean, what was their thought process in saying that four years is what it's going to take by adding in four more counties? And can you tell me also why, um, if those four counties have been supportive of it, what kind of feedback have you gotten from them? Representative Fisher. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Anderson, um, I really don't know the reasoning. I did not uh, question, I did not talk to the Met Council asking uh, for the entire details on it, outside of the fact that they felt it would take this extra time to get the work done. I have not talked to representatives. I will have to admit that I have not talked to representatives from the uh, counties of Chicago, Santee, Sherburne, or Wright. Representative Anderson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Representative Fisher, did you talk to the members that are from those counties at all, the legislators? Representative Fisher. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative uh, Anderson, no, I have not talked to them. Representative Anderson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and thank you, Representative Fisher. And what concerns me about this piece of legislation is basically what we're hearing is when we as a legislative body say we're going to sunset a committee, that it's okay to ignore what the legislature has put in place. We have meeting minutes here from this entity meeting on January 24th of this year, past the deadline that we said that they were sunset and continuing to meet and continuing to spend citizens' tax dollars. I would vehemently, uh, I vehemently oppose this bill. I think uh, we need to send a message to those, when we do sunset you, that means it's done, you're over. You shouldn't get your uh, expenses reimbursed. We have a situation where four counties are gonna be added into this and they haven't even been consulted. They're probably not even aware that this bill exists. And not of the, none of the legislators that represent those counties have had a chance to talk to their folks or know about this or, or get any feedback from them either. There's a reason that this committee was put in sunset and the magic number of four seems to be just that, magic. There is no reason or thought behind why four years. So Representative Fisher, I appreciate what you're trying to do here, but I think it's a little premature. I think that you need to do a little bit more homework. And members, I recommend that you vote no. Representative Scott. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm wondering if uh, Representative Fisher would yield to uh, a couple of questions. He will yield. Representative Scott. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Representative Fisher, do you know, does this, um, does this group, this commission, do they determine use water limitations on water usage? Representative Fisher. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Representative, I'm not too sure I uh, understand your question. Can you clarify it a little bit more in terms of water usage? Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, this is the Metropolitan Area Water Supply Planning um, Advisory Committee. So I'm wondering if this group, one of their tasks, is, is one of their tasks to determine limitations on water use on a per city basis. Representative Fisher. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, Representative, going to the uh, point that you raised is the, the Met Council, uh, as of right now, cannot apply uh, any limits on cities. They prefer to work through a cooperative, voluntary process. In terms of the, this advisory committee, this advisory committee is just studying the area, seeing how the water flows in and out, how it's being used, and making recommendations that if they continue operating at how they are right now, 
what will be the water situation for providing drinking water to us in the metropolitan area and giving them forms of varieties of what will happen if they were to change different uh, inputs and outputs in the equation. Uh, it's very important work for them to be able to figure out how they're going to meet the needs of the metropolitan area as it grows to make sure we have enough water. And part of the studies that have been coming out have been showing that right now we don't have enough water to meet the needs as we are moving right now. Representative Scott. Yes, if, if Representative Fisher would yield to um, another question. He will yield. Representative Scott. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, so I'm not really getting a clear um, um, answer on whether they set limitations, but I'm wondering, um, do you know, would they have the ability to um, define penalties and also fines if, if because I, I, you know, I'm, I have a copy here of um, the statute, the, the purview of the committee, and it looks to me like maybe they, they would be charged with setting limitations on water use, and then I'm guessing that if a city went over that, there's a limit there for a reason. Would they then be able to set the fines and the penalties for those cities? Representative Fisher. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, as, as I'm listening to you here, it seems that we're kind of straying from where this bill originally started. It seems that uh, originally we were talking about a sunset, and now we're talking into water uses and who may have regulations and authority over different things. And I, I think the important thing that we have to take a look at is originally this was set up so that the, uh, this committee could do some very important work to meet the water needs in the uh, metropolitan area. And I think the big question is, is that because legislatively we added on extra work to their plate, it seems to me to make a lot of sense that legislatively we should give them the extra time to get the work done. Representative Scott. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, I'm wondering, um, this group that um, you find, um, you know, that there's a grand purpose for it to exist, how often does this group have to provide the DNR with a master water supply plan? If uh, Representative Fisher would yield, please. He will yield. Representative Fisher. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, uh, Representative, uh, I'm just asking to have the water plan here extended uh, so that they can do their work. Um, I think we're getting into a lot of other details that we don't need to be going over at this point. Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, well, Representative Fisher, why would we vote yes on to renew um, the ability for this committee to continue to be in existence if we really didn't understand what the committee does? It's really important to find out, you know, what the purview of this committee is, and and you know, is this a, is this a, a, some issues that cities could reach out to one another and determine these things on, upon themselves without the um, the uh, the big brother of the Met Council having to oversee everything that every city in these counties does. Um, if uh, Representative Fisher would yield to another question. He will yield. Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, well, I'm wondering if this group then, um, because the Metropolitan Council has taxing authority then, would this group um, indirectly have some taxing authority? Representative Fisher. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Representative Scott, this is just an advisory co uh, committee task force that is set up to uh, make recommendations in terms of water supply. Representative Scott. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, then they could advise the Met Council to, to raise taxes. Am I right? Uh, if Representative Fisher would yield. He will yield. Representative Fisher. Uh, this is a group that is more along the lines of trying to address and predict what's going to be happening with water supplies. That seems to me that uh, they've been more focused on those type of issues than dealing in tax issues. Typically, the Met Council doesn't use these kind of study groups to look at those kind of issues. Representative Scott. Well, well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, well, thank you, um, Representative Fisher, for um, attempting to answer these questions. Um, I, I just feel that um, this bill is not ready for prime time. We really don't understand, uh, the author doesn't really completely understand what this bill does and what this committee does, what, the, what their oversight is. And for that reason and the reasons stated by Representative Anderson, I would encourage a no vote. Representative Pepin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would Representative Fisher yield? He will yield. Thank you. Representative Fisher, the um, advisory committee 
did uh, expire as of December 31st, 2012, and I think there was good reason for that. Representative Anderson talked about some of those. Uh, a lot of times these just have a limited time frame. But I'm wondering, Representative Fisher, if you can tell me, I was looking at a website and I noticed they've met several times during the year, already this year, and, um, including at least January and March. And one of the agenda items was to discuss the work plan of the group from 2013 to 2016. And I'm wondering if you can explain that, why they would be working, making a work plan when they were expired, why they were even meeting. Representative Fisher. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Pepin is uh, the Met Council does have the authority to do their own advisory committees and do some work on their own. But what they're trying to do is come back and circle around and, and make it more official so that they can continue to have the official support to have the different groups and agencies that they currently have working with them and also to continue the, to have the official involvement of the four counties that this legislative body did add to their purview uh, back in 2010. Representative Pepin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm not sure that that answers my question. I, um, when we sunset an advisory commission, they, they, they're supposed to be expired. They're not supposed to go on without uh, further approval. That's why we have sunsets. It's extremely frustrating. Um, but as long as I'm still um, up, I'd like to see if Representative Fisher would yield to another question. He will yield. Representative Pepin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Representative Fisher, one of the frustrating things for one of my communities is that they pay in a large amount to fiscal disparities. In fact, per capita, it's the highest city that pays in for fiscal disparities for a small city of 11,000 people, having to pay in uh, being the highest in the top 20, actually, per capita. Um, having to pay in fiscal disparities is very frustrating. And the thing that's even more frustrating is that they are not following, they don't get regional wastewater services. And I'm wondering, Representative Fisher, this is a huge area of concern to my community. We've requested it several times. And uh, Representative Fisher, I'm wondering if the, uh, this advisory committee is planning on looking at this disparity going forward. Representative Fisher. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Pepin, I don't know if I really understood your, your question there because we're talking about um, the Water Supply Advisory Committee and it sounds like this is going into a whole different area. Could you repeat your question so I could understand it, please? Representative Pepin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Fisher, I, I gave you a little bit of background there because I think it's important as to why I have this concern. Rogers is at one of the communities in the metro that pays in to fiscal disparities. Representative Lincheski has spoken about this several times. Rogers pays more per capita in fiscal disparities than any other community. And the reason that's especially frustrating is because of the top 20 communities that pay into fiscal disparities, Rogers is the only community that does not have regional wastewater services through the Met Council. And it seems to me that this, is the, this committee should be looking at that. And I'm wondering if this committee goes forward if we're not going to sunset it, if it's going to look at this disparity because it's an issue of equity and fairness. And I, I'd like to know, I am frustrated that the, the committee has been meeting without, uh, after it's been expired, but if they're going to go forward, I'd like to know what their intention is on looking at this issue. So if you could, if you could yield to that question, that would be great. He will yield. Representative Fisher. Uh, thank you, Mr. Spe Speaker, Representative Pepin. Uh, what I want to focus on is this is a water supply advisory committee. Um, I know that the community I'm in, uh, the part of the community I'm in, we don't receive our, our water from the Met Council. Um, I, I think the big thing that we have to focus on is that there are parts of the metropolitan community that are having problems meeting their water needs and will be becoming very severe in the future. It's impacting what is happening to our resources in our lakes. And I think it's important that we realize this is a group that would like to continue the work that is happening in an official way so that we can manage our water in a sustainable process. And what we're just asking for is to have the sunset extended so we can give them the, the official authority to carry out a plan that is very critical in our communities. Representative Pepin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and Representative Fisher. Well, I, like some of the other legislators, I'm, I'm frustrated with this because it's unclear what the mission is and it's unclear why we're 
giving it, them another few years. The Met Council is such a huge organization, and as it already is, and we continue to, to grow it and grow it. And it's, uh, it's highly frustrating, and I encourage members to vote against this. Representative Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I would uh, encourage members to take a moment, if they've got questions about what the Metropolitan Area Water Supply Advisory, advisory, advisory Committee does, is uh, take a look on, uh, just go onto your search engine and write, type that in, and it'll come up. And it has uh, all the information. You can look at uh, news and events. You can look at the advisory committee members. You can look at their agenda and minutes funding and finance, uh, publications and resources, who's on it, uh, all that information about their advisory nature to the Metropolitan Council, not the DNR, not the Pollution Control Agency, but to the Metropolitan Council is right there, uh, just a couple clicks on your, on your laptop. The bill in front of us, the bill that Representative Fisher has, is simply extending the sunset. That is something we have the authority to do as legislators. We can make a decision. Now, the advisory committee did sunset, and we've had a long discussion about sunsets. We can make a decision to extend an advisory committee. That is all that Representative Fisher is trying to do. He sees, and I agree with him, that there is a value in having local governments provide advice to the Metropolitan Council for water supply planning, not for taxing, not for fiscal disparities, not for local government aid, but for planning on water supply. Now, if for the last few months we've been having a lot of testimony in our committees about groundwater issues, this is a very important issue. Representative Fisher's area, White Bear Lake, water supply issues are important. It is a good time to extend an advisory committee on water supply when we are having problems with our water supply. So I support what Representative Fisher is doing, simply extending this advisory committee from 12 to 16, 2012, December 31st to 2016. If you want to know what the, what the advisory committee does and the authority that it has, look at the bill water supply planning, advice, advice. That's what the bill does. It is not a, a complicated issue. It is not, there's not something here that you think is here that's somehow hidden. It's extending the advisory committee, and I would encourage your support. Representative Newberger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I rise uh, today to uh, ask members to think deeply about this, uh, what we've got going on here. Two of these counties I represent are in my district. I spent the better part of this morning on the phone with uh, irrigators and farmers uh, from my area, uh, which is Sherburne County where I live, and I also represent, as I said, uh, a second county here, a little chunk of Wright County. Um, right now, the rural areas, the agricultural community is going to be scrutinized uh, by the DNR for their water use. Uh, one of the farmers that called me today told me that his, uh, the cost for him to uh, use his own water is going up 700% uh, for him to do that. Uh, for you rural members, uh, please, please keep this in mind um, that this is going to have ramifications that go beyond today, that you will, uh, even though this only extends out to uh, four counties, uh, when we start to uh, creep outwards, this is going to send a message. Uh, ask the irrigators, the irrigating uh, people in your, in your area how they feel about a duplication of government uh, watching over what they're doing in the agricultural industry. Um, I really, uh, the comment was made earlier, Mr. Speaker, that this is simply an advisory committee. Advice, advice, advice. I understand that. You can drill that into my head. But, Mr. Speaker, um, People, uh, people and organizations act upon advice, and I, I, don't, uh, I don't approve of the Met Council reaching out into areas where it isn't formally recognized. Uh, it doesn't have uh, the legal authority, and here we have the Met Council clearly doing this. Uh, this is an encroachment into an area that we were not in, informed about. 
Um, right now what we have is we have a collision here between the, uh, the metro area and the rural, uh, the first ring rural areas, the agricultural communities. And members, if you uh, represent an agricultural area, you might really want to look at this because this is going to send a shockwave back to you. Uh, when the folks that uh, farm for a living understand that you're willing to yield ground on this, it's not going to go well with them. I just uh, offer that as a word of caution, and I also want to thank you for your time. Representative Johnson. Mr. Speaker, will the author yield for a short question or two? He will yield for a question. Representative Johnson. Representative, uh, did I hear you correctly that uh, you stated you did not contact the counties involved in this? Representative Fisher. Mr. Speaker, Representative Johnson, uh, that is correct. I personally did not go out and contact the counties that were involved. The, we did have hearings where they had the opportunity to come speak. None of them did attend at that point in time. Representative Johnson. Mr. Speaker, while we're sitting here talking about this, I made a couple of phone calls to two, two different county commissioners. One's the chair of one of the, one of the counties involved in this. The other one's a, a commissioner in the other different county. Neither one of these commissioners had even heard about this bill or aware of its going on. Both of them stated they are not in favor of this bill. They do not want this. We, we were also told to look up uh, the website. I did to find out what this council does. Very, very first thing on what they do, it's, it's the council will design and adopt fees and charges using in a regional, regional cost of service basis. It also says the municipal watershed shall be allocated, which means they, they're going to form a plan to ration the water. This is not what, I do not believe this is what this is designed for. This, board needs to end. Representative Yerusso. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, there was a reference to the meeting agenda previously for the uh, advisory council or advisory committee. And I'm a little bit surprised that the person that referenced that did not read the minutes from that, in which many of these questions are answered. Um, the Metropolitan Council described the role of this advisory committee. Uh, first of all, it clarified that the council is a planning agency, not a regulatory agency, answering one of our previous questions. And it says it was established to advise the council in addressing water supply needs. The council collects, shares, and analyzes regional technical information and develops tools, provides assistance in water supply plan development, analyzes regional and local water supply emerging issues and provides solutions, facilitates cooperation between communities and supports local efforts. We've had many questions about why don't the local communities do this, why don't the counties do this. The Metropolitan Council is the means by which we have established in this area uh, cooperation among the local communities. And I think we've had some confusion between the role of this advisory committee and the Met Council itself. Many of these complaints, arguments, questions have really been directed at the role of the Met Council, and I suggest that if members have an issue with the Met Council, they take that up, they bring forward some bill that has to do with that. This committee is organized to provide the information that the Met Council needs to do its work. And I don't understand why anybody would want the Met Council to do its work with less information rather than with more information. I urge your support of the bill. Thank you. Representative Dean. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would Representative Fisher yield a question? He will yield. Representative Dean. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Fisher, uh, in your talks with uh, local officials, uh, are there any local... Uh, I'm just going to speak specifically to White Bear Lake, not the region or anything else. Specifically on or near White Bear Lake, are there any construction projects or any physical projects that are necessary to continue or start as, a, as it relates directly to the passage of this legislation? Representative Fisher. Thank you, Representative Dean. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, uh, Representative Dean. Uh, in terms of the uh, 
uh, sunset date on this bill, it would not have any impacts on any kind of construction co uh, projects uh, that are in the area that I'm aware of. This is just an advisory council, so that would not have an impact that I'm aware of. Representative Dean. Thank you, Ms. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and would Representative Hansen yield a question? He will yield. Representative Dean. Thank you, Representative, or Mr. Speaker and Representative Hansen, if you could. Um, you brought up White Bear Lake, and uh, that is a district, an area that I represent. I represented uh, Matamita and Birchwood uh, and portions of the lake uh, that uh, Representative Fisher currently does before redistricting, and now I actually represent the Delwood portion and the White Bear Lake portion of the lake, so I'm kind of working my way around. I've uh, met with uh, lots of folks who live on the lake, and I can tell you for people who haven't been on White Bear Lake, this is a big deal. Uh, it's not just down a little bit. There's something going on that's very dramatic and very different uh, that's going on right now. And I can tell you that it's not just impacting folks who live on the lake. It's people like my kids who don't live on the lake who can't use Ramsey Beach anymore and all their friends and uh, folks who used to be able to fish and boat on the lake now can't. As I'm walking around with my dog, I can see that the ice is retreating and it's not, it's, it's not gonna come back in a good, in a good way, I'm afraid. Uh, so Representative Hanson, when you talk about relief to folks on White Bear Lake, uh, they're in a very different boat uh, than folks in other areas in the Northeast Metro. Other lakes that I represent and have represented don't experience what they are experiencing now. I'm concerned when I hear the DNR and MnDOT talk about uh, getting together and have commissions and extending commissions and having work groups um, and having advisory, that that's not adding one drop of H2O to the lake. And these folks are very, very stressed and uh, it's not getting any better. Uh, I want to provide some better information to the people I represent that we're actually doing something that is going to put some water in the lake. We need drops of water in the lake, in fact billions of gallons, uh, and not more study and not more discussion and not more putting things down the road. Understand we need the data, we need to find out what's going on, uh, but that's very little satisfaction to the people around the lake and in, in the northeast metro area who enjoy that particular lake. That's what I'm most concerned about that's why I'm concerned about legislation that continues to talk about more layers of government and more study and more, uh, more government getting together to talk more and less H2O in the water uh, in White Bear Lake. I understand it's a regional issue, but I'm very parochial on this particular issue about getting water in the lake, and that's my concern, Representative Hansen. Can you give some assurance to my constituents who are going to call me and, and say, when is this going to translate to water in the lake and how does that happen? Because I'm not confident when I hear that the Met Council is now in charge. Representative Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and Representative Dean. Um, in the moments while we've been uh, debating this, I've been trying to find some of the maps that we've uh, been presented in the Environmental Finance Committee. Uh, where we've seen kind of the regional nature of water use. And I think all of us who uh, are in the metro and around the state, when we look at our water resources, whether they're a lake, river, or stream, the impacts of uh, our water usage and our water supply, um, we, we don't base those based on geopolitical boundaries. Uh, the county line or the city property uh, hasn't had an impact. So that's where something like this advisory committee can assist because the data that we gather and we you are you are uh, alluding to the fact we've done a lot of study and we have and that study now is coming forward where we can make some decisions uh, when we have the environmental finance bill in front of us next week we will debate this a little further in terms of investments and to monitoring um, but this advisory committee is critical when you look at the regional nature of water supply and water use. And all members, this is an issue I'm sure you're going to have your constituents asking about, water supply and water use. So uh, uh, sometime today, if I can find those maps, I'd like to get them out so you can see where use is coming from, where supply is, where some of those issues are, where we've already paid for those. The advice goes to decision makers at the local level, but also to us at the state level where we can 
uh, handle these water management problems. Okay. Representative McDonald. Mr. Speaker, would the author, author uh, yield for a question? He will yield. Representative McDonald. Uh, Representative Fisher, why is Wright County in this bill? Representative Fisher. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative McDonald, the reason it's in the bill is because that's the original law. That's the original law that uh, came before us. So I did not add anything to it. This was put in. Uh, it's one of the counties that was originally put in when this was passed before. Representative McDonald. Mr. Speaker, thank you. I'm glad that was your response because I knew that. I knew that you didn't. I knew it was in the law since 2005. Uh, would the author yield for another question? He will yield. Representative McDonald. Representative Fisher, do you think it's a good idea for the Met Council to advise outside of the metropolitan area, counties that are not in the metropolitan area? Representative Fisher. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative McDonald, um, as, as I take a look at this, we're just looking at a sunset uh, group making advisory to the Met the Council to uh, deal with water issues in their area. And as I take a look at the counties that are bordering it, some of the water issues that they're dealing with are coming from aquifers that are affecting those areas. And so I would think it would make sense to be able to have input from people in those areas as to what's going on. Representative McDonald. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, Mr. Fisher, Wright County don't, doesn't want advice from the Met Council Water Commission that your bill proposes. We're not even part of the Metropolitan Council, and if you speak to anyone in Wright County, mayors, councilmen, uh, commissioners, we don't want to be a part of the Metropolitan Council. We don't want anything to do with them, and for some reason, some legislator down here thought to whip us into their bill and be part of their advice. We don't want their advice, no offense to the good people that are going to these meetings, which incidentally, folks, this commission, this advisory commission expired last year, and yet in my hands, no props, uh, I have minutes from January 14th. They're not even supposed to meet. Now, no offense to the good people who are meeting, because they didn't know any better, but they're meeting for the sake of meeting. Legislators put this in for a reason, Representative Fisher, that it sunsets. The sun sets. It's a good thing. We've got beautiful sunsets in, this, in the country, in the world. They set for a good reason, because the legislators at the time the bill was proposed and passed thought it was a good idea to have this advisory commission and end it. But now, and it's not your fault, you probably were given this by someone on the staff or who, who, who knows who, uh, to say, hey, this is a good bill, let's, let's have these meet. Well, I just spoke to, uh, thankful to uh, Marion O'Neill, Representative O'Neill, we called one of our commissioners, Pat Sawatsky. He didn't know anything about this. No, I don't care if the Met Council want to meet and they have an advisory commission. I don't give a rest. That's fine. But Wright County doesn't need it. We're not a part of the metropolitan area. He doesn't know anything about it. Matter of fact, Met, according to the minutes, they have, rep, they have uh, one of the commissioners as members is uh, Elmer Eichelberg. He was a great commissioner for many years. Great, great conservative, good man. He's retired. And yet they still haven't listed as a member. So they don't even know that. It's not needed, Representative Fisher. Let it sunset. Let the good people who are here before us uh, do their job or did their job that said sunset. And at least leave Wright County on it, but we don't want it. We don't need it. We're not part of the Metropolitan Council. It's a useless bill. It doesn't need it anymore. Let it sunset. Representative Wagenius. Well, thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. I am enjoying this conversation no end because I think it's the conversation we are going to have when our omnibus uh, finance bill for DNR and PCA and uh, agriculture comes before you next week. It is an appropriate discussion uh, for that time. One of the things we're going to discuss is how different the geology is in all parts of our state and how hard it is for under, to understand our next door neighbor and that their water may be very different than what we have. And it's, we're going to be discussing that water does, underground does not stop at county lines. It would be convenient if it did and found, followed our county borders, but it does not. So. With that, I would also uh, invite uh, Representative Dean uh, 
to part particularly participate in the issue because of the worry about um, White Bear Lake and not getting an extra drop of water in the lake. The problem right now is if we put another drop of water in the lake, it'll go right through the lake like a sieve into the aquifer because there's a blank in there and the water's just going down. The USGS has told us that. It's told us if we don't do something different, then the sieve will keep on being a sieve. In the meanwhile, members, we do better when we have great information and we do great when we can share. And this is a lot of sharing that needs to go on. This is a good idea. Vote for Representative uh, Fisher's bill. Representative Fisher. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to clarify a couple of things. This first of all, is with the four counties that were being uh, referenced here, Chisago, Sh Santee, Sherburn, and Wright, they're only being referenced in an advisory cap uh, capability. Is The bill that we have here makes it very clear that this is only going to apply, the advice and recommendations of this commission will only apply to the areas that Met Council covers in the counties of Anoka, Carver, Dakota, Hennepin, Ramsey, Washington, and Scott counties. Uh, it's something that is very important. Uh, this was brought before us last year. Unfortunately, they were not able to receive a hearing in committee. I think if there would have been a hearing in Representative Pepin's committee last year, that a lot of these things could have been addressed and a lot of the questions could have been solved at that point in time. And at this point in time, I would like to ask for a green vote so that we can have the sunset extended so that this group can do its important advisory work so that we can get our, uh, our solutions resolved here in the metropolitan Pilotin area. Thank you. Representative Draskowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, wonder if the author would yield. He will. Representative Draskowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Representative Fisher, um, I find it very interesting that we've got a committee that we sunset um, or that sunset on its own, and um, I've got copies. I've heard others talk. Uh, it appears they've been meeting for the last three months. I've got copies of the minutes from January, um, and I've got the agenda, but not the minutes from March, and I'm assuming they may have also met in February. Um, but did we, pay, did we pay reimbursements for the people to attend these meetings? I, I realize in statute uh, that they have the ability to be reimbursed for their expenses. Um, did the taxpayers of Minnesota reimburse these people who met against the law on this committee? Representative Fisher. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Truskowski. As of right now, no, nobody has been paid any reimbursement rates. Representative Truskowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, Mr. F or Representative Fisher, it, um, it's perplexing to me. We have, I, I've got the minutes from January. Uh, the, the law calls for the composition of this particular task force or advisory committee to have the members be the Commissioner of Agriculture, Commissioner of Health, Commissioner of Natural Resources, Pollution Control Agency, the Metropolitan Council, and some of the counties. Looking at the minutes, the members of representatives from the Minnesota Department of Health, the MPCA, the Minnesota Department of Agriculture, and the DNR were all in attendance at a meeting that was held contrary to the law. The people in our government are not following our law. And Representative Fisher, you have a bill to basically gloss over that and say, it's okay, we'll cover you retroactively and pretend it didn't happen. It's okay. It'll be okay if you met and it'll be as if it never happened and you can continue to meet into the future. Members, who is, who, who is writing the law here? Is it the legislature and the governor? Or is it the people who work for the government? Because apparently the people who work for the government don't care. They met anyway two, three times, two or three different months. The committee was supposed to be gone. 
but they didn't care. Where is the accountability? And Representative Fisher, you're going to cover up this accountability? We should instead be going and asking these people why they weren't accountable to the law of the state of Minnesota. Members, I encourage you not to support this bill. And instead, let's uh, ask the legislative auditor to visit these folks. Representative Abler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. I'm surprised we're still in this bill. I was at a different meeting, um, so I missed a lot of the debate. But I do want to just tell you the problem the city of Ramsey has with water uh, and White Bear has with water. Uh, we're mining water and sending it away, um, and this is a real problem. Uh, I think water is going to be the future gold. Um, and so uh, I don't know the specifics of this, of this committee, but I know the city of Ramsey can't draw another well. Uh, in it and has to draw water out of the Mississippi and pay a lot of money for it. And that's going to be a problem. And so um, I'm just going to tell you what I hope this committee works on and that they find ways to help. The city of Andover, by the way, or some Scott, um, doesn't have to uh, pay a price like Ramsey has to pay a price for some water, which is an interesting thing. So I think the more we talk about this and solve it, the better. I, I, I'm not going to testify to the merits or demerits of the t debate I didn't hear. But I think this is a good idea and I'm voting for it. So thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Uglum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, curiously enough, uh, Champlin being right next door to uh, Mr. Abler's, Representative Abler's uh, area, we do have the same problem. Uh, as mayor, we were, I was forced to spend a lot of money, our council was forced to spend a lot of money to drill another well because our aquifer is dropping also. Um, so I am concerned about this. I'm concerned about big government. And I'm concerned about, about, you know, duplicative agencies and agencies meeting when they're not supposed to and everything else. But the Met Council has said that there's going to be a million more people in the metropolitan area in about 20 years. A million more people in about 20 years. So I'm concerned where we're going to get that water. And... I think that we do need to examine this and study it in the future. Thank you. Representative Newberger. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just want to encourage rural members to remember one thing. Uh, as far as this is concerned within the metropolitan area, that's their business, that's their problem, they can deal with it. That's a Met Council, metropolitan issue, fine. Uh, but four of these counties do uh, rely heavily on agriculture. Um, it's not going to reflect well for you members if you come from an agricultural district to vote for more water re uh, regulation, especially when it duplicates what the DNR is already trying to do, uh, which is, uh, I hate to use the word because we use it so much, but it's egregious. It truly is. So if, if you vote in favor of this, rural members, just remember you're going to have to go back and answer to the people in the agricultural community that, that you uh, that you voted in favor of allowing uh, additional regulation. And yes, only... Yes, it might only be advice today, but advice today is taxes tomorrow. I don't think it's going to sit well with the, with the rural members. So just remember that when you go home and face your farmers, you're going to have to answer to them. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Seeing no further discussion on the bill, the clerk will take the roll on the bill. Clerk will close the roll. There being 78 ayes and 53 nays, the bill prevails uh, and it's, uh, the bill passes and its title agreed to. The next bill on the calendar for the day is House File 853. The clerk will report the bill. House File 853, number four on the calendar for the day, an act relating to public safety. The author of the bill, Representative Savick. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And this is a very simple bill. This bill increases the threshold with triggers the requirement that a volunteer fire department, uh, fire relief association be audited. 
currently relief associations' assets or liabilities of at least 200,000 are required to submit audited financial statements to the Office of the State Auditor, in addition to their annual financial reporting forms. And I want to repeat that last sentence, in addition to their annual financial reporting forms. This bill increases the audit threshold to $500,000, and I request that you vote yes for this. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Pep and moving to amend House File 853 as follows. The amendment is coded HA 53A4. Representative Pepin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. This amendment is very straightforward. It just changes the number by deleting the 500,000 and inserting the 350,000. I believe it just provides more accountability than the original bill, and it, it splits the difference. Members, I'd, uh, I'd ask for your vote to ask for a roll call. And I'd like a roll call. Roll call has been requested. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative Savick. Um, I ask the, the members to vote against this amendment. If you take $200,000, which that was set in 1986, and inflation would bring it up almost to 500000 so there really isn't an increase in the level if you look at 1986 dollars. Representative Doubt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think uh, the amendment is not on the floor yet. Okay, thank you. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the amendment. The clerk will close the roll. There being 49 ayes and 81 nays, the motion does not prevail. There's another amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Dreskowski moving to amend House File 853 as follows. The amendment is coded A1. Representative Driskowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, members, this amendment will provide that if uh, that those who are currently uh, under this uh, reporting requirement in this statute, those organizations, those fire departments, um, that are between two hundred thousand and five hundred thousand uh, dollars, that they would be required to report at least once every four years. So once every four years, rather than once every year. Um, members, I, I should point out the state auditor did a report um, on these uh, pension system or these pension funds in 2007, and in the report, the auditor said that uh, because public funds are involved, relief associations must be accountable to the government agencies that protect the public welfare. Uh, volunteer firefighters are entitled to some assurance that their pensions are safe. Well, members, we are not looking out for the pensioners in these funds if we don't have any oversight whatsoever for the two hundred to five hundred thousand dollar categories. It's important for us to protect the people who manage these funds from the liability that could accrue to them if uh, their particular fund is found to be um, in. Uh, uh, in a uh, financial position that is not proper or uh, could, uh, could degrade to uh, illegal. So, um, members, what this amendment does is protects not only the people who manage those accounts, but the people who are pensioners who uh, rely on them uh, in, their, in their pension years. So I'd encourage your support for the amendment. And I ask for a roll call, Mr. Speaker. Roll call has been requested. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative Muglum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I rise in support of the amendment also. One thing uh, uh, about local fire boards, and I speak from experience with this, is local fire boards are usually 
comprised of a couple of elected representatives and then a lot of staff and uh, other members perhaps of the fire department. I think we all know sometimes with the crush of uh, all the legislation and things that even city councils or mayors or whatever have to work with, oftentimes fire board matters get pushed to the side. Oftentimes at fire boards the elected officials rely a lot on staff and if staff is maybe not doing quite the best job in everything else there can be problems. We're incumbent as elected officials, it's incumbent on us to do a good job managing the people's money. I fear this bill goes a little far uh, and I would support the amendment that we have so elected officials uh, can have a little more oversight. It's the people's money. We need to remember that. Thank you. Representative Savick. Um, the law now requires that they turn in a financial report every year, um, and this bill or this amendment would... Uh, the consequences would be that the fire association would lose their eligibility for fire state aid and could not receive municipal contributions if this was passed. Therefore, I urge everybody to vote no. There's an amendment to the amendment. The clerk will report the amendment. Benson M. moving to amend uh, the A1 amendment by Draskowski as follows. The amendment is coded A6. Representative Benson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm going to temporarily withdraw the amendment uh, pending the A7 amendment. Representative Benson withdraws the amendment. There's another amendment uh, to the amendment at the desk. The clerk will report that amendment. Pepin moving to amend uh, the A1 amendment as follows. The amendment is coded A7. Representative Pepin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Uh, the amendment to the uh, Draskowski amendment just simply says that if there are any misappropriation of funds in this group of uh, folks that have been audited, um, they have to continue to file annually until they have three clean reports. And I think this is really important because we need to be accountable to those people that are counting on these pensions. And Mr. Speaker, I'd like a roll call. Roll call being requested. There's 15 hands. There will be a roll call. Representative Savick. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I object to that amendment and don't because with it they would lose their eligibility for fire state aid and they would also not receive municipal contributions and this is very important to keep these funds accurate. Representative Driskowski. Thank you Mr. Speaker. Wondering Mr. Speaker if the author of the bill would yield. She will yield. Representative Driskowski. Thank you Mr. Speaker. Um, Representative Savick, you mentioned that uh, you believed that uh, these fire departments would lose state aid, I think you said, and uh, would not be able to receive municipal contributions. Uh, I have never heard that before. Can you tell us, um, can you tell us more inside references? Because Representative Savick. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, because right now, uh, in addition to putting in an uh, audit report, they have to put in their uh, annual financial reporting forms every year, and it requires them to do that every year. And if we've, and you're going to four years, and if we go to four years, then they'll lose their contributions from the state, and they'll also, uh, the city won't be able to, con and that's under the law. So thank you for the question, but we can't do it. Representative Driskowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, well, Representative Savick, I'm confused because your bill raises the threshold from 200,000 to 500,000. Those individuals and those associations are completely exposed uh, by your bill. So if what you just asserted to us as a weakness uh, of both of these amendments is true, uh, your bill uh, even has more exposure. So uh, can you help explain that a little more? She, she'll yield. Representative Savick. You're confused? I'm Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You're confusing two issues. An audit costs a lot of money. The financial statements they think they can do with local um, accountants. And so still have to put in the, the uh, annual financial statements 
but we don't have to do the audits until they reach a, a, a level of 500,000, according to this bill. So this says nothing about uh, eliminating the annual financial statements. And I vote, and I encourage everybody to vote no on this amendment. Representative Pepin. Mr. Speaker, um, would Representative Thavik can yield to a question? She will yield. Representative Pepin. Thank you. Uh, Representative Savick, I have to say I'm very surprised by your response to this, and I'm wondering if you can cite the law. My amendment simply says that if the state auditor determines that there's been any misappropriation of funds, theft, embezzlement, financial fraud, or others, that they would have to file annually and, until they get three clean reports. Could you cite the law that says that they can't, because of this, somehow get state aid? Could you direct me to the, the spot? Representative Savick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, no, I cannot direct you to the spot, but I have been told that this is the law, and I am I've been assured that it is the law. And uh, it does state here that their financial reporting forms have to be in every year, or they will lose their uh, support. Representative Pepin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Wow, well, I don't know about you. I've been assured. Uh, I know you were a mayor of a, a town, and... As a mayor, you're also a fiduciary, but, you know, people are counting on their pensions. And we don't have a site in law, and I'm not, uh, I'm not very comfortable with, I, well, I told you so, and that's why. Um, if you vote against this amendment, I, I, really, I really urge you to consider reading the amendment, because um, if you don't think that they should have to do another audit if they've been found to misappropriate funds by the auditor, I, I don't know if you think you're doing a service to your pensioners or not, but... This would be a, frankly, this would be a pretty bad vote to uh, vote against this. So uh, I would encourage you to vote for the amendment. The amendment. Representative Uglum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Would the representative yield to a question? Representative Savick will yield. Representative Uglum. <laughs> representative Savick. Um, the financial reporting that you're talking about right now, um, that's an unaudited financial report. Is that correct? Representative Savick. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, that's an unaudited on, financial report, but it's open to the public, and anybody can go and look at it. It's presented to the firefighters, and it has to be passed by the firefighters, and they fill out the form. So that's done every year, um, and it, do, it does put a check on whether their uh, reporting is correct or not. So, and most of the firefighters do this every year, I mean, every, they have to do it in order to qualify for uh, their uh, state aid and their contributions from the local city. So I um, re respectfully request that everybody vote no against this amendment. Representative Uglum. Mr. Chair, would the representative yield for another question? She will yield. Representative Uglum. With the uh, financial reports that you talk about, uh, and I have sat on many fire boards for a long time, what is the guarantee that those numbers and those those uh, uh, those those uh, represented representations of fact in the uh, financial reports are true if they're not audited? How do you know that those numbers are correct with just a financial report? Representative Savick. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I would say when they get a contribution from the state, everybody in the fire department knows what the contribution was. And when they get a contribution from the local uh, city, everybody knows what that is. And I'm sure that if you looked at your 401K or your investments, you know when there's some money missing out of there that's not required about. And it's not, it's not nuclear science. It's just a simple form that they have checked by uh, local accountants and they go through a rigorous accounting with this. So it's the whole fire department that's responsible for this, this report. And I urge, I urge everybody respectfully to vote against this amendment. Representative Uglum. Mr. Chair, well, I would just submit to you that it, the whole fire department that's responsible for this report is the, is the problem. Elected officials Elected officials are responsible for, the, for this money on fire boards and things. And I think a little bit of extra scrutiny on, on this cannot hurt. The amendment itself is not 
a very tough amendment by any means. It just provides a little more uh, oversight uh, of the people's money. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Howe. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, as I read the bill here, I, I guess uh, I fail to understand the difference between the amendment and the bill. Because if it is true that they have to file the reports every year, as I read the, the bill, it appears that all we did was raise the limit to $500,000 to not only get an audit, but also to, su to supply the financial report the way I currently read it. And so I believe that the actual amendment provides some relief there that the and provides a, what I would say, a compromise. But I'm concerned that if, if the author d is correct, that it allows, it, it eliminates the capability of participating in, in grants and that funding, I'm concerned that the current bill eliminates them from that funding. So uh, I believe that the, uh, the, the amendment's a good amendment, and I... I urge folks to uh, support it. Representative Doubt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would Representative Savick yield for a question? She will yield. Representative Doubt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker and Representative Savick. I just want to make sure that I understood what you said, uh, that you were opposing these amendments or the, uh, the underlying amendment and the amendment to the amendment because you thought that fire departments w would, would lose aid because somewhere in these amendments it said that they would have to file financial statements less than every year and that would conflict with the requirement for providing aid. Am I understanding that correctly? Representative Savick. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The amendment said that they would have to uh, turn in a financial report every four years and what state law requires is a financial report every year which is checked by a local CPA and which costs a lot less than a financial audit that is done by a CPA. And so I request that everybody vote no on this amendment. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the amendment to the amendment. Clerk will close the roll. There being 59 ayes and 72 nays, the motion does not prevail. To the amendment, to the amendment. Rep Representative Benson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd ask if the, the author would rise for a question. She will yield. Representative Benson. Thank you. Uh, to the author, uh, I have uh, 853 in front of me. I'll just ask you a question. What, what do this, the um, relief associations do now uh, who fall under the 200,000? Representative Savick. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The relief associations that fall under 200,000 uh, have to turn in a financial report every year which is reviewed by a CPA, which is not the same as a full-pledged audit. Saving money. Representative Benson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker. If she'd rise for another question, if she'd rise for a series of questions that probably expedite things. Well, she can yield each time. Representative Benson, thank she'll you. yield. Um, <clears throat> so, in the, in the, uh, uh, the bill, what you're asking for is that the people between the two and the 500,000 now go to an annual report and not forego the audit. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Savick. Yes, that's what the bill requires. At, they have their annual report, but they don't have to go through an annual audit. Yes. Representative Benson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Well, help me understand how the uh, Driscowski Amendment doesn't continue to require the same thing that you're asking for, except for giving a buy for those between two and 500. Um, except for, in mind, of course, we're going to get to in a second here, where we're going to ask if there is a discrepancy that's found that the uh, auditor may do, may do, uh, or may require that they they do audits then thereafter until they've had two years of clean audits. If the author would rise. She will yield to, and we're discussing the, the amendment, the Druskowski amendment. Representative Savick. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I did not understand the question. Would you please repeat the question? Representative Benson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I apologize to the author, and I'll try it again. So in, in the Druskowski amendment that I'm trying to amend, um, it just simply says if the association has assets or liabilities, and it gives the same numbers that you do of more than 200 and less than 500, the association must prepare and file a financial report and submit statements at least once every four years. So you're... You're, what you're saying and essentially is that we're now violating the law that there makes a requirement of that same group of people to not do, uh, to do one in order to get their state aid. If, if I'm not mistaken, could you answer that question? Representative Savick will yield. Representative Savick. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, what I am saying, and I, if I understood your question right, is at this time they all have to all fire relief associations have to turn in a financial report which is reviewed by a CPA every year and this bill doesn't affect that at all. All it does is raise the level for audits which are much more expensive. So I ask everybody to vote against this amendment and thank you. Representative Benson. Thank you. Okay. To the author. Uh, I I understand completely what the author is trying to accomplish with the bill, um, and uh, and and I. But I think that what we fail to see here is that there is some opportunity to make sure. Now we're talking about a half a million dollars worth of finances, uh, and um, you know the future, the pensions of individuals that we're trying to protect. That we need to add some kind of additional comfort language. Um, that allows for, uh, if there is a discrepancy, and, and my amendment, of course, now it, you know it, it's going to get voted down. I'm sure because uh, it, you know it doesn't comply. But what my amendment will try to do is to make sure that we're offering some protection to those groups. That if there is some kind of discrepancy, that they will have to for, that they will have to have an audit. So I'd, I'd appeal to the author to potentially consider adding an amendment to your bill that will allow for that safeguard to be put on. Representative Doubt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I might as well try to take one swing at this, too. <laughs> um, and, it, you know, for me, the, the hang-up here, uh, Representative Savick, is if there's another section of law that says that these fire uh, relief associations have to file a report every year, uh, this would not conflict with that. Or to get their aid if they have to file that financial report every year, this does not conflict with that. This just says they have to file it at least once every four years. Okay, so if there's another section, this doesn't say they must file it only once every four years. It simply says at least every four years. So this would not conflict, I think, with what you're talking about. And I know, I think we might be talking about two different things here. Uh, but th the reason that you're stating that you're against the amendment, um, this would not you know, preclude anybody from getting aid. This doesn't say that you can't do it every year. And if there's another section of statute uh, that says you need to do it every year to get some sort of aid or credit or whatever, you, this does not conflict with that. This simply says you have to do it at least once every four years. So it's, and I, and I think you guys are talking about a slightly different issue, but your reason for speaking against the amendment really isn't valid. So that's the point that I wanted to make. Representative Benson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to. I'm going to offer the amendment, and uh, encourage the author to look at it, and um, uh, and encourage her to uh, approve it. And it's, it's simply, it's it's. There's plenty of comfort language in there. The auditor may. Uh, simply, it's an opportunity for 
uh, us to make sure that we're doing the right thing in protecting uh, the retirees' pensions. And I think, I, I think you're sensitive to that. So I would ask for a roll call on this. So the clerk will report the amendment. Benson M. moving to amend House File A-1 uh, as follows. The amendment is coded A-6. Roll call has been requested. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative... Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the amendment to the amendment. Circle close the roll. There being 59 ayes and 72 nays, the motion does not prevail. The amendment to the amendment is not adopted. To the Driskowski amendment. Any further discussion? Representative Driskowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, uh Representative Savick, I, I don't know that we still uh, understand your arguments. Um, if indeed there is some place in statute that is telling us that basically keeping the law the same for once, for at least once every four years, but not necessarily all four years, for those between 200,000 and 500,000, is somehow going to put relief associations in jeopardy of municipal contributions or losing state aid. If indeed that is the case, show us where it says that. You have not shown us that. Mr. Speaker, would the, would the uh, author yield uh, to that question? She will yield. Representative Jaskowski or Representative Savick. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If you look at the statute 69051, financial report, bond, and ex ex uh, examinations, the bottom part of that financial statements, it does say that they need to do a financial statement every year. So therefore, the bill to do a financial statement every four years would be, the amendment to do every four years would be counterproductive and would actually put them in jeopardy of you losing their support and their uh, contributions by both the state and the municipal. And I vote. I ask everybody to vote against this amendment. Representative Jaskowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, Representative Savick, uh, you uh, referred to 69.051, which is a section covered in the bill. That's what I thought I heard. And I've got it here. But you are basically striking the asset and liability limits of 200,000 and e increasing those limits to 500,000. That's your bill. That says that those from 200,000 to 500,000 would no longer be required to prepare a financial report covering the special and general funds of the Relief Association for the preceding fiscal year to file the financial report and submit financial statements. 200,000 to 500,000 under your bill will no longer be required to do that. That's what your bill says. Your bill says that. My amendment says let's back up and let's require instead that those from 200 to 500,000 submit the same things, a financial report uh, and financial statements at least once every four years. So what we are doing with this amendment is saying, I like what is currently in law, but let's loosen the restrictions for those smaller associations so that they have the option to either report once every four years 
twice every four, two out of every four years, three out of every four years, or every all years out of four years, depending on what they want to do. It's up to them. So I don't, I still don't see, I, 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 I don't think uh, we are um, on the same wavelength, wavelength here. Uh, if, Mr. Speaker, if the, if the author could, um, could yield for another question. She will yield. Representative Jaskowski. So given that, Representative Savick, can you again show me at 69.051, which is exactly the section covered in your bill, where we are somehow uh, limiting the ability of, of the people covered in this bill to receive municipal contributions or state aid? Representative Savick. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In that bill on subdivision 1A, and it's uh, 69.051, it simply says that they have to turn in a financial report every year. Uh, we're mixing up two things. The audit and the financial report are not the same thing. And under the law, you have to return, they have to turn in a financial report every year. If they don't, they lose their um, eligibility for the fi uh, fi state fire aid and for uh, municipal contributions. That has nothing to do with the audit. There are two different issues, and I don't know what I can say to make you understand that. Representative Draskowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, Representative Savick, um, your bill removes the requirement simply that they file their financial report and financial statements. It does nothing with the audit. Your bill does nothing with the audit. It, re it relates to exactly the same process, the same requirements that the amendment does. So, Prepare and file a, a financial report and submit financial statements at least once every four years. The bill doesn't talk about in section in, in section one of the bill. It does not talk about an audit. So, uh, Representative Savick, uh, I am still thoroughly confused by your argument, where you still haven't shown us. Uh, that there is any inconsistency or problems uh, with the ability of these relief associations. I, I don't see anything in the bill relating to municipal contributions or, uh, st or state aid. Um, and I haven't seen anywhere else in statute that you have pointed us to say that that is an issue. So, uh, members, I would ask you to support the amendment, and uh, we still have not... Uh, had any uh, refutation of the ability for this amendment to line up properly uh, or in any way limit the ability of these relief associations. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative McNamara. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm wondering, Mr. Speaker, if Representative Savick will yield to a question. She will yield. Representative McNamara. Thank you. Uh, Representative Savick and your able help next door to you I'm wondering if either on the computer or in hard copy, if you had a copy of the statute book. I think if you look farther down, you'll begin to understand what Representative Draskowski is trying to do. If you go down to subdivision one, paragraph B, you will read that it says, um, excuse me, Mr. Speaker, I, I lost my line there. The accountant or auditor conducting the examination shall give an opinion as to the condition of the special and general funds of the relief association. And above it, I didn't read it all, but it relates to paragraph A. So what it's saying, the gist of it is, is what Representative Draskowski is saying. And if you talk to any of the volunteer firefighters around here, Representative Howell, Representative Hackbarth will tell you that their local fire associations are required to have an audit. Members, there's three different levels of accounting are done. There's a compilation, it's a simple thing, and that would be a financial report. You can get a review, a higher level, or you can get an audit. If you'll notice, it says an examination with an opinion. 
an examination with an opinion, I'm not exactly positive, but I'm almost positive it's only an audit. It may possibly be a review. I don't think it is. I think the only way you get a real opinion is with an audit. What Representative Draskowski bill is doing is saying that at the very least, if you're going to fall between 200 and 500, you need to have an audit every four years. Oftentimes in business, you won't be required to do the same kind of financial statement every year. I remember oftentimes for our bonding companies, we would be required to have a review annually, and then every other year you may be required to have an audit. Representative Draskowski, what you're offering is a common sense thing that offers the volunteer firefighters and association to save some money each year, but then periodically have the audit done. That's the gist of it. So Representative Savick, my question to you is, do you understand paragraph subdivision one, paragraph B? Did you now get a chance with your staff to look at that and understand Representative Draskowski's amendment? Representative Savick. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, I understand and I have read, in fact, Today, I checked the legality of my bill with the state auditor's office, and they approved it and said that it wouldn't affect that. So uh, I'm going to take that as the authority, and uh, please vote against this amendment. Representative McNamara. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And then I, I did confirm it is an audit. Representative Draskowski would not be a review of it. It would be an audit every four years, and it would allow some savings for folks there. But yet, every four years, you would get an audit. Thank you. Representative Erickson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Uh, I was a part of the legislative audit to report uh, that uh, was uh, delivered in 2007, and I'm checking that report and noting, uh, Representative Draskowski, to support your amendment, that these volunteer firefighters uh, have to submit uh, reports to five different agencies at times. Five different state agencies they have to report to. Annually, uh, and this is 317A.823, they have to report that they're a nonprofit. That's to the Secretary of State. Uh, 424.8.04, they have to give a copy of their bylaws and any changes they've made to the state auditor's office whenever that occurs. Uh, 69.051, which is Representative Savick's uh, amendment to, uh, uh, relates to her uh, bill here on the floor, uh, the annual financial audits or statements to the state auditor. 424A10, annual request to the Department of Revenue for reimbursement of supplemental benefits paid. Then we have 424 and 69, uh, two references there, and, and uh, those are annual reports to the local government agency showing available financing, accrued liabilities, and when applicable, the required municipal contribution. So I would think, Representative Draskowski, that your amendment is... Uh, is in, in good standing because of this last reference I read in that they already have to submit to uh, the local governmental unit all of this information. And so if they didn't have to do an audit except for every four years when they have this amount, I, I would think we would be doing a good thing for them because of all the reporting they have to do. And that was one of the complaints they had when the Audit Commission heard the report is that those who had done the study found out from these volunteer firefighter organizations that they were inundated with paperwork all the time. They were constantly having to report something. So I think the way I see your amendment is you're providing some relief. Uh, and I think Representative McNamara was pointing that as, that as well. Some relief for those that have these very small funds uh, to deal with, and this would provide that relief for them. Uh, members, there are also other uh, references. They have to submit to the Campaign Finance and Public Dis Disclosure Board uh, all of the Relief Association board members who have filed with those required economic interest statements like we have to. Uh, 356 year-end financial reports to each plan member. 
and then 356A.07 sub 1, a summary of benefits to each member and to existing members and benefit recipients upon request. That's 11 different references. So I, I think, members, that Representative Dreskowski has a common sense amendment here to the statute that Representative Seth has brought for us. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the amendment. Close the roll. There being 58 ayes and 73 nays, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. The clerk will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, House File 853. Third reading. Further discussion of the bill. Representative Albright. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'm wondering if the author of the bill will yield for a series of questions. She will yield. Representative Albright. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Representative Sabic, um, I understand that you were the mayor of a small town in southern Minnesota which had a, uh, a volunteer fire department as part of the uh, functionary of your job as mayor I'm, and as a fiduciary. I'm just wondering if you could expand on uh, your responsibilities to the statements that uh, governed the activities of the pension for your uh, town's uh, retirement plan. Representative Savick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I attended a meeting once a year where they went over their retirement fund and it showed how much we had contributed and how much the state had contributed, what their re um, return on investment was, and how they projected out to the future. Um, as far as the responsibility for the financial statement, that was their responsibility. And for the audit, that is their responsibility. And they paid for that audit themselves. Representative Albright. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and uh, Representative Savick. Uh, I'm just wondering, as in your capacity as the mayor and as being overseer for all the departments of the city in that point, did you uh, reckon uh, the uh, statements on an annual basis, and did you sign on that statement as it was prepared order, as the Mr. acting Speaker. mayor of that town? Mr. Speaker, Representative point of order. Representative Falk. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Rise to a point of order under Section 124 of Masons. It's not the... Uh, question of the person but the measure of debate that's permitted and this is clearly questioning uh, Representative Savick's previous occupation. It's not appropriate before the body. Advice, Mr. Speaker? Uh, I'm, the, I'm going to rule the point of order not well taken. Representative Albright. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, Representative Savick, um, as the bill uh, is, uh, in the, that you have put forward, I also recognize that uh, the Office of Legislative Auditor put together some uh, findings uh, with regard to uh, volunteer fire departments. And candidly, uh, based upon what your bill does in comparison to what the findings and or recommendations of the OLA uh, put forth, I'm a bit surprised that none of the recommended changes and or observations uh, that were in that report were included in your bill. And I'm just wondering what substantiation you have for not including some of those, which in my opinion were very fine uh, recommendations. Representative Savick will yield. Representative Savick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I wanted to keep the bill as simple as possible, and I did check with the audit, the state auditor, and they are neutral on this system, on this bill, and uh, 
I have a lot of responses from the field and, and fire departments in Minnesota that they're thanking me for putting this bill forward. So uh, I vote. I request that everybody uh, vote positive or vote yet green for this vote. Representative Albright. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and thank you for that response, Representative Savick. I just, I, I guess, I'm perplexed from the standpoint of we are a fiduciary to the people that protect our homes, our businesses, and our livelihoods, and to the extent that we can ensure that their pensions, which they heroically provide and earn on a daily basis, and make no mistake about that, uh, I think that your bill, from a from a financial perspective, actually provides for a greater propensity for fraud because of the language it allows you not only to put a, a report on the books but every four years. And I'm just wondering if that is of a concern to you. Representative Thank you. Savick. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. One of the things that I've failed to mention before that these audits actually take money out of the retirement fund and uh, they reduce the amount of pension that a firefighter gets when they retire. And that is one of the reasons for presenting this. And this was presented at the request of fire departments. And I feel that there is enough. There, if you look at what the, the annual reports that they have to put out every year, it, there is protection for, um, against fraud. Besides, all the reports are public, um, and anybody can check them. Representative Albright. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, 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 Representative Sabak, I again appreciate your comments. Uh, and I, I also draw your attention to uh, uh, the OLA report where it talks about that the state auditor actually did provide uh, training opportunities uh, for these uh, volunteer firefighter uh, agencies, and it was uh, not met with a lot of, of, of uh, response. Uh, to the point that uh, one of the recommendations of the OLA was to uh, offer uh, increased uh, uh, training but also an opportunity to uh, uh, participate in, in the state uh, investment board uh, pension plan. I'm wondering if that would be something that you would uh, endorse uh, and uh, possibly look to amend into your uh, bill in the future. Are you asking her to yield? I'm sorry, Mr. Speaker. Yes, I am. Representative Savick will yield. Representative Savick. I think that that doesn't pertain to my bill, and uh, if that's what you desire, I suggest you write a bill to that effect. Seeing no further discussion on the bill, the clerk will give uh, the clerk will take the roll. We'll close the roll. There being 111 ayes and 19 nays, the bill is passed in its title, agreed to. The next bill on the calendar for the day is Senate File 166. The clerk will report the bill. Senate File 166, number 5, on the calendar for today, an act relating to emergency medical services. The author of the bill, Representative Schoen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This bill is uh, a uh, kind of an agency bill. It's uh, cleanup language that's requested by the Emergency uh, Medical Services Regulatory Board and the Minnesota Ambulance Association. It has to deal with federal conformity. Uh, it's uh, just changing some titles under current law to match uh, uh, federal law. So I'd encourage a green vote on the bill. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Draskowski moving to amend Senate File 166 as follows. The amendment is coded A1. Representative Draskowski. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, members, this amendment would simply uh, require that a paramedic uh, is not able to or must not provide legal advice or recommend legal counsel to a patient. I'd encourage your uh, adoption of the amendment. Representative Schoen. Mr. Speaker, would uh, Representative Draskowski yield to a question? He will yield. Representative Schoen. Representative Draskowski, uh, can you try to help me understand why? Representative Draskowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, Representative Schoen, as uh, I would expect you know, uh, EMTs and paramedics uh, are interact with people who are in very traumatic situations, who very likely were involved in injuries or other places that uh, there is an eventual tort coming. So um, I think uh, it's in the best interest of both the EMT and their uh, protection and in the interest of the patient that we don't have EMTs providing legal advice to them. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Sean. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I uh, appreciate the clarification. Uh, members, the uh, Minnesota Ambulance Association uh, vehemently uh, deny or does not want this uh, added to the bill. Um, I, and thank you, Representative Draskowski, and you may be bringing up an issue that may need clarification in the future, um, but this type of thing would certainly uh, uh, create a problem related to more training, uh, which would be an increase in expense. Uh, secondly, um, you know, I'm a police officer paramedic, so I'm not really sure. I, I give legal advice all the time. And then secondly, EMTs are mandated reporters. I think the language may be a little bit too vague in uh, being specific as to what you're trying to accomplish, and it could cause a lot of problems uh, uh, under other guidelines. So I, I just would simply ask you to vote no on the amendment. I do appreciate you highlighting something that may need to be looked at in the future, but uh, as it stands, uh, please vote no. Representative Draskowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Representative Schoen, for uh, the discussion. And, uh, you know, I think this is an area that hopefully at some point we will look at and, and uh, uh, an area that we uh, should maybe bring some clarity to. At this point, Mr. Speaker, I withdraw the amendment. Representative Draskowski withdraws his amendment. There's no further amendments at the desk. The clerk will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, Senate File 166. Third reading. Further discussion. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the bill. The clerk will close the roll. There being 130 ayes and zero nays, the bill is passed and its title agreed to. The next bill on the calendar for the day is House File 131. The clerk will report the bill. House File 131, number seven on the calendar for today, an act relating to commerce. The author of the bill, Representative Slocum. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, this is a bill that is very consumer friendly. A woman contacted me from my district, which is where a lot of our bills come from, and she said that one of her relatives had died. And in clearing up the estate, they had to run an estate sale. They hired an estate sale person who ran the sale and then took the money. They never got any of the money from the sale. Well, she was pretty upset about that. And you've got a grieving family. I thought that that uh, that was a pretty sad situation. So I went to the Attorney General's office and I said, is this just one situation that I got a call on? Or do you hear complaints about this? And she said, yep, I've had a number of complaints. At which point I drafted this bill. And what this bill does very simply is it requires people who do estate sales, who conduct the estate sales, that they get a surety bond so that if perhaps they go with the money, the people who, who hired them can get justice, can get their money from the estate sale. Very simple. 
Um, people who conduct auctions, if it's an auction, they are not covered in this bill. If the auctioneer conducts at an estate sale, then they need a bond. But if the auctioneer is conducting a um, auction, no, they don't need a bond. It's pretty consumer friendly, I think. Um, then I was curious, so I did some phoning with, at bond houses. And I said, okay, you know, I, I'm putting this, putting this requirement on people that do, or I want to put this requirement. How much does it cost somebody to get a bond? I had no idea. You can get a bond either in your county or a state or at the state, and the interest that you pay on that bond and what you pay for it is based on your credit rating. So I thought, you know, that's kind of justice coming full circle because someone with a really poor credit rating is going to pay a fairly stiff interest rate. Um, and someone who has kept up and, and has done what they should do would have a fairly low interest rate and probably would do well with the uh, consumers. So that's the bill. I welcome your questions. There's no amendments at the desk. The clerk will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, House File 131. Third reading. Representative Krisha. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'm wondering if uh, the author will yield for a couple questions. She will yield for question. Representative Krisha. Thank you, Representative Slocum. I, I admire what you're bringing forth here, and I just want to make sure that uh, we're looking at all the, the layers. And it sounds like you've done some homework, so you're probably just going to clarify a couple simple things. Will, um, will this cost, and what is it, you mentioned it, what is the additional cost on average for bonding for uh, an auctioneer to do this? Representative Slocum. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative, you're going to need to repeat your question. My headphones aren't working. So shout it out. <laughs> Representative Krisha. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, you did the homework on the cost. What was the average cost that would be added to auctioneers for the bond? If, if you were an auction, rep Mr. Representative Speaker, Slocum. Representative, if you were an auctioneer and you were conducting an auction, you do not have to have a bond. You wouldn't, have, you wouldn't be covered under this bill. If you are an auctioneer and you're going to conduct an estate sale, then you would have to get bonded. So there is a difference, auction, estate sale. They are different entities. Does that answer your question? Representative Krisha. Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, but for the estate sale, what would be the... You, if you're doing the estate sale as an auctioneer, you would have additional costs to purchase the bond. Is that correct? Representative Krisha asks Representative Slocum to yield. She will yield. Representative Slocum. You're going to need to repeat that one for me, too. Representative Krisha. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If an auctioneer does an estate sale, can you hear that? Is that better? Then they'll need to purchase the bond, correct? And how much will that cost add to their, to their, their, uh, their, their operations, their business for that sale? for the estate sale. Representative Slocum. Mr. Speaker, Representative, that would be based on their credit rating. I couldn't tell you exactly what it would cost um, because the cost of the bond is based on a person's credit rating, the person's credit rating, so. Representative Krisha. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and will, Ms. Slo will Representative Slocum yield again? How about She will yield to another question. Representative Krisha. How about a range? What, what's the range just so we have a ballpark? Representative Slocum. Okay. What I, Mr. Speaker, Representative, what I have here is if, um, let's see, if it's a state bond, it's totally credit-based. If it's a county bond, 1% uh, with a $100 minimum fee. And for a credit, for credit-based, the state bond, seven, uh, if you have a credit score of 700 or higher, it's 1 to 3% of the 20,000. And then if it's less than 700, or your interest rate, excuse me, is 1 to 3%. And if your credit rating is less than 700, it can be 10 to even 20% interest on the bond or charge. Representative Krisha. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Will Representative Slocum yield again? She will yield, yes. Representative Krisha. So, Representative Slocum, so the range, from what I'm hearing, could be anywhere from 200 to as high as perhaps 700 to $800 based on your credit rating. Is that correct? And a, a, a ballpark. Representative Slocum. Mr. Speaker, Representative, it's based on the credit rating. From my perspective, it really pretty much separates the girls from the women, the men from the boys. If you've taken care of your business and your credit rating is good, you're not going to pay very much. If you've been a little shady and haven't really taken care of business very well, you're going to pay. So I think it, it actually adds to the safety of the bill. Does that answer your question, sir? Representative Krisha. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And will Representative Slocum continue to yield? She will yield for another question. Thank you. Okay. Representative Krisha. And so, okay, I, I, so there will be additional costs. We can agree on that, it sounds like. And I just want to make sure uh, we're not pinning people who have credit scores because of things that have happened in their lives as shady people. That, that's certainly probably not your intent. Representative Slocum. Mr. Speaker, Representative, no it's not. Contractors have to have bond, they bond to make sure that they're, the people that, performance bonds, to make sure that they perform according to contract. That's essentially what this does. Representative Krisha. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Representative Slocum, will you continue to yield? She will yield, Representative Krisha. So just a couple more questions then. Currently, aren't there a, no, uh, a number of consumer protection measures in place, whether that be carrying insurance, whether that be uh, reporting to the Department of Commerce or Better Business Bureau, or even legal recourse? So aren't there already a number of measures in place? Are we just adding another layer here? Representative Slocum. Mr. Speaker, Representative I don't believe so. I believe it's a protection, and I think that it helps consumers get what they contracted for. And uh, the Attorney General's office said she has received a number of complaints about this. So it isn't just this one situation. It's, it happens. And you've got people who are grieving, so they're pretty vulnerable. I don't think that they should have to go to court or uh, there was also an article in the Star Tribune about this um, not about a year ago about these estate sale people and most of them are fine and wonderful and terrific and do what they're supposed to do but there are some that aren't and what this does is protects the consumer. Representative Krisha. Thank you Mr. Speaker and will Representative Slocum continue to yield? She will yield. Representative Krisha. So I'll, I'll, get, I'll ask two questions at once. Um, will this provision work better than the, than the current provisions in place? Because I'm sure there's plenty of them. And the second one is, does this bill require all, uh, all folks involved with this, with the estate sale, to provide this bond, or will counties have the option of opting in or out? Representative Slocum. Mr. Speaker, Representative. This is strictly consumer protection. Representative Krisha. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Representative Slocum, if you'll continue to yield. I understand it's, uh, I understand it's continuing, I understand the consumer protection. My concern is, are we just adding more layers? Um, it's in front of the House floor. That's an important uh, discussion to have. And so my next question would be, are there penalties if you don't have this in place? And what are those penalties? What if someone doesn't know the rule on this? I see it's in January of 2014. My concern is we're just putting folks, and I know some of these folks that do these estate sales, are we just putting one more layer in place where there's lots of government protection already? Representative Slocum. Uh, no, we're not putting... Oh. Mr. Speaker, Representative, no, we're not putting another layer on. There are very little regulation. There's almost no regulation. In fact, to my knowledge, there is no regulation on estate sale people. You 
can go hang a shingle, should you so desire. And then you can go conduct estate sales. There's no training, there's no certification, there's no education. There is no protection for anybody who hires you. This bill doesn't add layers because they also don't have much recourse. Consumers don't in this situation, other than a major lawsuit, which is expensive and oftentimes more expensive than the estate itself. So this is like a construction bond to guarantee that the consumer gets what they want and need. Representative Kresha. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and thank you, Representative Slocum. I, and I do understand the consumer protection. Again, I know some of these folks, and I'm just wondering if we're not going to see them come back a year from now uh, saying, you know, I, I don't know all the rules on this, or this is added additional costs, because they could be high. And is the credit rating on the, the sole proprietor? Is the credit rating on the LLC? Is it on the corporation? I mean, there's, there's just lots of factors. And, I, I just want to make sure that we're not here just doing one more thing when there's already consumer protections in place. So if, if Representative Slocum would answer that question, and that would be my final one. She will yield. Representative Slocum. Mr. Speaker, Representative, I'm thinking about ways to have estate salespeople certified and licensed right now. And that will hopefully bring that next year. There's nothing... They have, and people that hire them have no real rights, except for what they contract. This just gives them a protection. That's it. Representative Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just a clarification, Representative Slocum. I understand what you're trying to do. And just a clarification, I'm looking at your, your bill language. It says it does not include auction and primarily farm or primarily household goods. So just a clarification that this would not affect a, a farm type sale, a state sale, and uh, this uh, rule that you have or law that you're looking at that would not affect a larger type sale, including a farm property, things like that. So it's a narrow interpretation. Is that correct, Representative? Representative Slocum. Mr. Speaker, uh, Representative, Yes, it's a narrow interpretation. Auctioneers, unless they're doing it in a state sale, if they're doing a straight auction, they're not involved in this. Representative Doubt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would Representative Slocum yield for a question? She will yield. Representative Doubt. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Representative Slocum, um, and I guess my initial, when I read this the first time, I was thinking that they would have to post a bond for every sale, although... It wasn't exactly clear, and I think maybe they just post one bond with the county, and they can do multiple sales within the county. Is that right? Representative Slocum. Mr. Speaker, Representative Doubt, that is correct. Representative Doubt. Okay, and then I just wanted to follow up on uh, Representative Creaser's question about the penalties, if she would yield for a question. She will yield. Representative Doubt. Is, is there any sort of penalty if they don't post a bond with the county? Representative Slocum. Mr. Speaker, uh, Representative Doubt, I'm not sure of the answer to that question. I, they're by law supposed to post a bond, so I would assume, I would think, that if they didn't post one, that there, there would be legal recourse, law enforcement would be involved. Representative Doubt. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and Representative Slocum. Any further discussion on the bill? Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the bill. Clerk will close the roll.
There being 90 ayes uh, and 40 nays, the bill, uh, the bill is passed and its title agreed to. The next bill on the calendar for the day is House File 143. The clerk will report the bill. House File 143, number 8 on the calendar for today, the first engrossment, an act relating to veterans. Representative Purcell, to your bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Uh, House File 143 is uh, an idea that was brought to me by the 11 Indian tribes in the state of Minnesota. And... Uh, we put it into bill form, and I could uh, just quickly read the bill here. The plaque authorization, plaque authorized memorial plaque may be placed in the court of honor on the Capitol grounds to recognize the valiant service of American Indian veterans from this state who have honorably, honorably and bravely served in the United States Armed Forces during both peacetime and war. The plaque must be furnished by the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council and must be approved by the commissioner Veterans Affairs and the Capital Area Architectural and Planning Board. And uh, as you can perhaps deduce, this, is, uh, this uh, plaque will be provided and paid for by the tribes of Minnesota, and uh, so there's no cost to it. Um, and uh, I thought it was a good idea, so it's a good bill. Vote for it. There's no amendments. The uh, clerk will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, House File 143. Third reading, Representative Detmer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and Representative Purcell. Uh, thank you for bringing this forward. I'm a co-author on this bill. I, I do have a question, though, that uh, I'd like to make sure that... Uh, Representative Purcell will yield. Representative Detmer. Um, has this plaque been approved by the CAP, the board, uh, the board CAP? Just wanted to check, make sure. Representative Purcell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Detmer, say that one more time. Has it been approved? Uh, Representative uh, Detmer. Yeah, Mr. Speaker and Representative Purcell, has the plaque been approved by the Capital Area Architectural Board or the CAP Board? Representative Purcell. It, Mr. Speaker, Representative Detmer, if I understand right, that the, the plaque, I haven't seen it, so I, I don't know that it's been presented to be approved at this point. Is, I'm... Is that, was that the question? I thought that was. The question is whether it's been approved, the installation's been approved by the CAP board. It, it, Mr. Speaker, Rep, Rep, Representative Detmer, I'm not aware that the plaque, as we speak, has been approved at this point. I've not been made aware of that. Representative Detmer. Well, Mr. Speaker, in, in, the, in the bill, it states that uh, in order for this to be put on uh, capital grounds, uh, that it would be, need to be approved by the CAP board. That approves all, everything that is put in, whether it's in the capital or on the capital grounds, that it would have to be approved by the CAP board before it would be, uh, be, be put in. And, and that was part of the legislation. Mr. Are you asking him to yield? Uh, uh, sorry, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, I, okay. my okay. my question is: Can you find out so the people on the floor here, uh, Representative, that it's been approved before we can vote on it? We have to know that it's been approved. Representative Purcell. Mr. Speaker, Representative Detmer, before it's placed, it has to be approved by the Capitol. Art area architectural and planning board. Representative Detmer. Mr. Speaker, so at this point, for what I understand, uh, Representative Purcell, is that it hasn't been approved yet. Is, is that the case? Representative Purcell will yield. Rep will yield. Representative Purcell. Mr. Speaker, Representative Detmer, to my understanding, no plaque has been approved as we speak. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Allen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, as a co-author, I speak in, in favor of the bill. 
Uh, American Indians uh, have volunteered to serve in conflict since World War II after they became citizens in uh, 1924. My own uh, grandfather served in the uh, Korean War and my son's grandfather was a Navajo uh, co-talker in World War II. Uh, for all American uh, Indian veterans, the honor of defending their country uh, overrode all other considerations. So members, I, uh, please vote in favor of this bill. Representative Pepin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would uh, Representative Purcell yield for a question? He will yield. Representative Pepin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, you mentioned something about uh, who was providing it. In the bill, it specifically says that the plaque must be furnished by the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council. I don't know if furnished means paid for or what exactly that means. Who exactly is, will be paying for this plaque? Representative Purcell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and Representative, the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council is comprised of the 11 tribes in Minnesota. The tribes are providing the plaque. Representative Pepin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm not sure I quite heard you. Did you say that the, it would Representative Purcell continue to yield? He will yield to a question. I yes, just want to clarify. So the tribes will be paying? It's your intent that the tribes, the tribes will be paying for the plaque? Representative Purcell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Pepin, that is correct. Representative Erdahl. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Representative Purcell, yield. He will yield. Representative Erdahl. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Representative Purcell, you and I are both uh, newly appointed members to the Indian Affairs Council, and there's only been one meeting since we've been appointed. I got there late and you weren't there. Uh, do you know if the Indian Affairs Council uh, has approved of this yet? Representative Purcell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Erdahl, I came late to the meeting. I don't know if this was on their agenda, uh, but I, I'm not aware if it's been approved at any, by anybody at this point in time. We're authorizing, and I assume the approval will come. Representative Erdahl. Uh, okay, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And uh, it's kind of a... I don't know what words to use to describe this, but uh, you know, I'm going to, to urge a, a green vote on this, but basically it's pending the approval of a couple of things, uh, one being the Indian Affairs Council and the other uh, being the CAP Board. But uh, you know, there's not going to be any expenditure of, of state money, uh, I guess, without those, those two approvals. You know, there wouldn't be any way. It's Indian Affairs Council money. But... Uh, this is one of those, again, kind of strange uh, moments where I'm urging approval of something that depends on two contingencies. Representative Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the State Government Finance and Veterans Affairs Committee heard this bill um, earlier in the session. And during the testimony, tribal leaders expressed that they were going to pay for the um, plaque. And in testimony of the CAP board in their overview, I believe I learned that in order for them to approve of things, that are going to be on capital grounds, the legislature has to approve it first. And so I think we're going in the right order. Representative Green. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I think uh, I did speak with uh, the, the people from White Earth Reservation, who I represent. And uh, it is my understanding that this was approved by the CAP Board in a previous session. This, this bill has, or this um, motion has been around for a few years now. It was uh, approved in, in uh, I believe it was last year, but then got taken out for some reason in, in a bill. And they brought it back again this year. 
And so uh, it is my understanding that, yes, they will be paying for the plaque, and all they need is the approval to put it up. So I, and if uh, Representative Murphy is correct, then uh, if they haven't, if the cap board hasn't approved it, it would still not be able to go to be put in until they do. So uh, I would uh, ask for a green vote on this. Representative Purcell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to those of you who spoke, uh, spoke kindly of the bill. I, I, I received some information and, and uh, want to share that uh, with members. The Indian Affairs Council has passed a resolution in support of this plaque, and Representative Deppner, I've, I've been advised that the CAP Board has approved the plaque. So. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion on the bill, the clerk will take the roll on the bill. There being 129 ayes and zero nays, the bill is passed and its title agreed to. The next bill on the calendar for the day, House File 232. The clerk will report the bill. House File uh, 232, number 9 on the calendar for the day, the second engrossment, an act relating to civil law. Represent Representative Hillstrom. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Members, this bill was brought to me by the Vulnerable Adults Justice Project. Um, this bill, um, the Vulnerable Adults Justice Project, is made up by um, associations and organizations as well as public agencies who look at Minnesota statutes and make recommendations for ways that we can change the law to actually do better uh, by vulnerable adults. Um, this bill really makes it much more clear in the power of attorney statute. It makes the short form that people use when they grant powers um, to have for people to have over their money and um, it makes it really clear what powers people who become powers of attorney actually have so one of the things that it does is it clarifies the responsibility of an attorney in fact um, and it makes the person who is accepting that responsibility sign as an acknowledgement right now someone could make you a power of attorney over their estate and you might not ever know it so this says that if you're going to give someone that power, the person accepting it actually has to sign for it. It also makes it very clear whether or not the person who accepts the power of attorney has the ability to gift themselves or other people. The default position is that the power of attorney does not have the right to give gifts to people without the express permission of the person granting that power of attorney. And so it puts a box in there that people can fill in to say, yes, I am granting the person who's going to be my power of attorney the ability to gift to themselves or to others. And the last thing that it does is it puts some accountability in with some judicial relief so that people who do um, abuse this um, and not have an accounting for these records when asked, um, that the court has some ability to intervene. Uh, members, uh, you have some letters of support from um, Aging Services of Minnesota, the Minnesota Board on Aging, and the and AARP. Um, this really is just making it much more clear so rather than having to have problems on the back end this makes it really clear up front what powers powers of attorney have um, for example um, most people think that if they're a power of attorney that they have the power to do health care directives they don't this form now makes that very clear and I urge your support there are no amendments at the desk the clerk uh, will give the bill its third reading third reading house file 232 Third reading, Representative Swadzinski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just uh, with the uh, 
Author of the bill, please yield for a question. She will yield. Representative Swidzinski. Just a question of clarification. Uh, talking about executors of estates and also uh, when you're talking about powers of attorney, sometimes there are levels. I've, I've been a part of a, 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 a estate issue where they had multiple folks, where they had, you know, the first person, if they refuse upon death or before death, that other people would be, would those all people be notified of that or it would be simply the like a top of a list or in a descending order or, or how would that process potentially work representative hillstrom thank you mr speaker um, members what this does is this says if you're going to use the short form for granting these powers so people have all other ways that they can do it in statute but this simply says if you're going to use the short form in statute that the person who is accepting that responsibility has to sign for it representative scott thank you mr um Mr. Speaker, um, would uh, Representative Hillstrom yield to a question, please? She will yield. Representative Scott. Thank you. Wow. Representative Hillstrom, um, have you talked to the Bar Association? I know they were had some concerns about the language not being quite as tight as they would like, and um, just wondering if you have addressed that with them and if there's uh, peace in the valley on that. Thanks. Representative Hillstrom. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Representative Scott, yes, we have been working with them. And in fact, I did originally have an amendment um, to just um, change the language slightly. It was just technical. It really had no substantive difference. And the language that they put actually didn't work. So I had to withdraw that amendment. Um, but in fact, we do continue to work to make sure that it, it does address any concern that anyone has. Representative, Representative Scott. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And thank you, Representative Hillstrom. I would encourage a green vote. Representative, Odris Representative O'Driscoll. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Would uh, the author yield to a question? She will yield. Representative O'Driscoll. Oh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Representative Hillstrom, I was listening. I thought I understood what we were talking about, and then there was a couple questions that maybe gave me just a little bit of a gray area. I want a clarification. In statute, there's a difference between an executor or a personal representative and a power of attorney. This deals strictly with power of attorney and appointing an, an attorney, in fact, whether it be a simple uh, power of attorney or a durable power of attorney, and that an executor or a personal representative is a completely separate issue from this. And I guess I'd like clarification on that. Representative Hillstrom. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker and members, um, this really deals with folks who are just using the short form power of attorney that is in the statute. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the bill. Clerk will close the roll. There being 130 ayes and zero nays, the bill is passed and its title agreed to. Reports from the Committee on Rules and Legislative Administration. Reports from the Committee on Rules and Legislative Administration. Murphy E. for the Committee on Rules, pursuant to Rule 121 and 333, designates the following bills to be placed on the calendar for Monday, April 15, 2013. House File 729, 1069, and 644. Report from the Committee on Rules. Murphy E. for the Committee on Rules. And pursuant to rules 1.21 and 3.33, designates the following bills to be placed on the calendar for the day for Monday, April, April 15, 2003. House file number 729-1060. House files 9. I am sorry. The following bills will be placed on the calendar for Tuesday, April 16, 2013. House file number 19, Senate file 1086 and House Files 283, 369, and 450. Motions and resolutions. Copies of the non-controversial motions and resolutions. Uh, motions uh, are on the House desk and online. If there's no objection to those motions, we'll take action on them first. Hearing no objection, those motions prevail. 
Howe moves that House File 146 be returned to its author. Representative Howe. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, this, uh, this is the companion bill to uh, Senate File 76 that uh, the members so graciously passed uh, earlier today. So just to clear the, uh, the record, we return that House File back to me. And, uh, and I thank everyone for their support on House File 76. Any discussion? Seeing no discussion, all in favor say aye. All opposed, no. Motion prevails. Abler moves that House File 1721 be recalled from the Committee on Health and Human Services Finance and be re referred to the Committee on Commerce and Consumer Protection, Finance, and Policy. Representative Abler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, this is a bill about uh, that related to the possible Fairview uh, merger with Sanford, and it suggested that if you're going to enjoy one of our wonderful assets, you only get to buy the business piece, and then Minnesota gets to keep the assets. And so I talked to both chairs. There's going to be a hearing next week in Commerce, and so I urge you to vote yes so it can go to the right committee. Thank you. Any discussion? Seeing no discussion, all in favor say aye. All opposed, no. Motion prevails. Announcements. Representative Marquart. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And members, members of the Education Finance Committee, we will reconvene at 6.30 in room number 5. 6.30, room number 5, Education Finance. And any other announcements? Representative Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move that when the House adjourns today, it adjourns until 3 p.m., Monday, April 15th, 2013. Representative Murphy moves that when the House adjourn today, it adjourn until 3 p.m. Monday, April 15th, 2013. All in favor say aye. All opposed, no. Motion prevails. Representative Murphy. I move that the House do now adjourn. Representative Murphy moves the House do now adjourn. All in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. The motion prevails. The House stands adjourned until 3 p.m. Monday, April 15th, 2013.